So today we have the cost of goods uh, for production and sales and marketing, and we will expand into the vineyard and tasting room as well. So be prepared for those workshops to keep coming, uh, and we'll continue to refine this tool as we gather more benchmarking data as well. And that's my other uh, plea to you also today is, uh, can you please fill out surveys that come through from the Oregon Wine Board? We really need salary survey information. We really need census information on grape tonnage and production. Uh, you know, we're a growing industry and growing quickly, and we have a very limited amount of data and research for an industry of this size. So we're really trying to scale that up so that we can be more efficient in producing these types of workshops for you and, and make sure that we're all at you know, highly performing levels and very successful in our business. Yes. So with that in mind, I am going to leave the wonderful Tim in charge to run the workshop for the day and chime, in, chime in where needed. <laughs> Thanks, Tim. Great. Who are any accountants, CPAs in the room? Yay, good. <laughs> then all of this is correct. <laughs> um, so a, a little background about myself. Um, uh, for those of you who already know me, you're going to see the, more of the pragmatic side of Tim Hanna, which is quite different from what you usually see. Uh, some people think pragmatic Tim Hanna is an oxymoron. <laughs> um, my background, I've been, been learning and studying wine since uh, now it's 52 years, and um, I've been in virtually every facet of the business and every channel, and um, and 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 you get also the uh, the the first American MW along with Joel Butler and one of the newest uh, uh, masters of wine in in North America. Um, yay! Uh, and 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 one of one of the things to. To, to actually help frame this, a, a lot of people don't understand that the, the Master of Wine program really is the business and sciences of wine. So you've got to know a lot of wine details and production and viticulture and all these kind of things. But it's, it's not so much the, the aesthetics per se. It's a, a completely different program from the Master Sommelier and without a fundamental understanding of, of business and implications of decisions and so on. Uh, it's one of the reasons most people don't pass the examination because we really don't focus on the wine business. Uh, as we learned yesterday and, and as I've learned in, in the nearly 30 years that I've been using this uh, uh, wine business simulation, if you will, as a, as a teaching format, uh, yesterday there were so many questions about, well, where do I account for this? How, what is a benchmark for this? How do I even know where to get this information? And this is why the, the, the stress putting on uh, when we're working, hey, dude, how are you, buddy? How are you? Good, great to see you. Um, uh, if, if you look at the uh, Oregon Crush Report, and we'll show you some data that we've input on, on our tool from, from it, there are, there's a lot of uh, data missing. Uh, if you, anybody ever seen the California Grape Crush Report? It's 160 pages of, of recording of every legal grape transaction in California. <laughs> and it's absolutely amazing, right? So one of our, our, our intentions around this whole program is not only provide you with better tools for managing and understanding cost of goods and all these other things, but also to to encourage everybody to participate so more data can be collected. If you're trying to figure out uh, uh, salaries and, and information for hiring your tasting room manager or for winemakers and this or that, you're, you're pretty much stuck with California data uh, because there's not enough data to run. And one of the, the surveys currently out there right now is a salary uh, uh, survey. We're going to be using this data to input into our workbook so that people have better information to run and, and optimize the profitability of your own businesses, okay? So about 30 years ago, I was teaching wine classes in Atlanta, Georgia, and um, 
I really got bored with what I was doing and knew I was boring everybody in, in the classes, but that's what wine education was and often is, is just boring trivia and people espousing their opinions. So I had a distributor who, who regularly sent their salespeople and they said, you know, I've got a new group of people I want, want you to work with them. I said, great. So I had them come over to my condo and we, we had six people and I put them into two teams and I said, each team open a winery. You guys have more money than God. You can do anything, buy anything, go. And you guys uh, uh, inherited a chrysanthemum farm in the Stag's Leap District and you have a house and you don't have a penny and you go. And it was, it was absolutely a blast. We really had fun because it was also a drinking game, of course. And, and so, and the people with the no money were doing all sorts of wonderful things and coming up with ways. We, we literally had, had one group that was growing, growing pot to make, and, and so they, they made a special wine that they called their dealer loader. <laughs> and, uh, um, and so they always had fun. Uh, and every time I did this, a group that had more money than God ended up fighting and arguing. No, oh, let's hire Julia Child as our, our, our winery chef that was back then. And we want Bob Mondavi to be our winemaker. And, and they're all fighting and arguing. And, um, and we did that for six weeks. And it was just absolutely a blast. And it brought up kind of everything about the questions, about decisions in the vineyard, in the winemaking process. When I joined Behringer Vineyards, uh, uh, now Treasury Wine Estates, Behringer Wine Estates back, back in 1988, uh, I was uh, uh, hooked into and later uh, uh, given charge of something called Train the Trainer at Behringer Vineyards. And I took this, this uh, teaching format and then uh, we created workbooks. So you name your winery and you do all these and we had a structure to it. And then uh, in 1990, I went down to Paso Robles when Behringer um, uh, bought the old Australia winery and started Meridian Vineyards with Chuck Ortman. Um, I, I was on the steering committee and later the, the board for the Cal Poly Wine Program at San Luis Obispo. And uh, a couple of their professors that became really good friends, Bill Amspatcher and Keith Patterson said, hey, why don't we get these put on spreadsheets? And, and actually put the financials in there. I said, yeah, do it. So they got a graduate student actually who formed a team and they created all these spreadsheets. Now who loves spreadsheets? Who hates spreadsheets? <laughs> I hate spreadsheets. <laughs> so, um, so about seven years ago, I was contacted by Sonoma State University and they said, uh, uh, would you be interested in creating our first fully online uh, wine business program? And I said, I think so. I've got some intellectual property. I've got to figure out how to, how to protect it and how to make it available. So, so I, I was talking to a friend who's now my partner, Chris Cutler, and he says, oh, well, you know, I can get this programmed and we can get this all online and people can, have the workbooks, we can make them simple and, and, and easier to use, and then you can save them and clone them and do all this. I said, really? He said, yeah, so we did that. Uh, and uh, actually at noon today, I'm, I'm, I'm teaching an international wine business course. It's an eight-week course with the Napa Valley Wine Academy, so I'll be in the kitchen over there while you guys are having lunch. And um, so we've got international courses now. My, my my current student group, we've got somebody in Paris, we've got somebody uh, in, in China, we've got two people in New Zealand, and whatever. So we started using these workbooks to teach um, wine business. It gives a structure to things because it starts with the business of grapes and decisions and, and what you need to know about pricing and costs and constantly battling balancing the decisions of, of cost and quality. So it's the, the supply chain and the value chain from the ground all the way to the consumer.
So when Brie called, she showed us this ready reckoner from the Australia Wine Board, and you plug in these numbers, and it runs these calculations for tax uh, and, and uh, import export or export market uh, things. But you can't save the information. You do these inputs and whatever. You can print it out, but you can't go back to it or rework it. And frankly, it was really narrow. So I said, you know, we could come up with a structure so that people get an account. Now, did everybody get your account set up here? Was everybody able to get into the account and you found your, your notices and passwords? OK, so um, we, we need to, to make sure to get her set up, and if you qualify. And uh, <laughs> you do. Oh, that's great, on the Oregon Wine Board site. Yeah, there's a, there's a, a, a registration button. And we'll go through it, and you'll get your, your password and everything. Um, so so uh, this, is, this is a complete overhaul of our entire system, brand new workbooks. We've been working with winemakers, uh, accountants, uh, custom crush people, to try and get a handle on costs. Uh, I've been working on this for 30 years, so we've got a really good idea. Now, one of our challenges uh, is that, that any kind of area of the, of the wine business in general, but, but certainly when we get finances, it's filled with what we call black holes. And I'll, I'll refer to that frequently. A black hole is, well, wouldn't you want to do this? And if you did that, then it could do this. But then you've got to do all these things. And it just goes on you know, to infinity. And uh, so we'll talk about what the tools do, the limitations. And there's kind of two ways to think about these tools. One is as an educational tool. So we're hoping that everybody's in this course will help share so that and, and get people at your winery also to become familiar with these tools. So if in, you're in production, you'll have tools that you can use directly. If you're in hospitality or tasting room and wine club management, uh, by the end of this month, we'll have a complete pro forma workbook that you can put in visitor accounts and traffic and conversion rates and all of your costs down to literally your first aid kit and, and everything you need to manage your tasting room effectively and a wine club uh, pro forma workbook that you put input how many members, what level, how many times per month, et cetera, et cetera. And it'll run your numbers. And you can create up to six different wine clubs and, and, and manage and forecast and so on. So that's what we're doing today. And uh, I've got a presentation. Let me see here. That's Bree. Keith's not here. I'm Tim. All right. So how we're going to go over this, and, and timing-wise, we ended about 4.30 yesterday, and, uh, and we'll, we'll, uh, we'll, we'll do about that same thing again. Now, what I've also learned about my own presentation skills, if I do a program one day and do it again the second day, I, it's usually not as good the second day. I'm sorry. But I'm really going to try to make this one even better. And, um, and I was up at 5 o'clock this morning on, my, on, on the workbooks trying to fix some of the bugs. So, so we're still, these are very complicated workbooks. And I, I did a brilliant fix yesterday on the fly that screwed up a whole bunch of stuff down the, <laughs> downstream <laughs> on my workbooks. But I think I got them all fixed this morning. So, um, so uh, yesterday, we also had uh, Keith Myers, uh, who's been our, our lead CPA on, on the case for this. Uh, uh, we need input and feedback from people. What, what kind of uh, uh, improvements can we make to the system, to the information, if you find a bug, and so on. Here's my direct email, tim at timhanai.com. Uh, if you come to Bend, uh, seriously, everybody's invited to dinner. So if you're over in Bend, email me, and I'll, I'll cook you dinner at our new house if we can get into it. Um, it's supposed to be next week. Uh, so, so let me know and share insights. Now, 
In the development of these workbooks, just uh, a quick aside, we put the workbooks out there and we had a bunch of people testing it and then we would get a list of uh, 20 different things to add to fix to this and that. And what we had to do to make these effective and, and usable on a screen and whatever is to build them out, put way too many features, then decide how we could simplify it and work it back. Uh, what I want, when we get to the workbooks, I want you to think of them as a, a uh, graphics deficient version of Farmville. All right, you get to input things and see what it's doing to your margins and your profit and loss. And, and wow, what if I you know, got another, another case per ton out of the press? What would that do to my bottom line or you know, this and that? So that's what we're doing. And uh, we're gonna go through sourcing and cost of grapes, production options and decisions, and then uh, arriving at a, a cost of finished wine. Um, and then we'll take a break. Then we'll go into cellaring, aging, barrel programs, packaging, and end up with a cost of finished goods. All right, so now we'll have the bottles, the boxes, the labels, and so forth. Then we'll take a, a lunch break. Um, and we'll segue, now that, that you under, have a better understanding of, of cost of finished wine and the cost of goods, uh, how do you manage a portfolio of products and how do you allocate them across different sales channels and, and your options there? And then this is going to actually uh, 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 become a, a P&L for your marketing and sales. You'll have your budgets, you'll have your payrolls, and you'll have a, a list of up to a, a dozen and we're gonna uh, increase that to 20 different products. And then we'll take another break, and then we'll come back and we'll talk about markups and pricing and what you do in your tasting room and, and wine club pricing, retail, restaurant, three-tier distribution, what you need to know about costs and factoring, all that kind of stuff, okay? So by the end of the day, our intention is uh, that you'll uh, understand the three different workbooks that we have. Uh, we've got a cost of goods calculator, we've got a marketing sales portfolio management calculator or workbook, and then we've got a pricing workbook. Uh, by the end of this month, we'll have the hospitality um, wine club management workbook. And then uh, by end of May, uh, we're hoping to have the most complicated of all, which is a complete vineyard uh, profit and loss uh, workbook that's every input of startup costs, equipment, supplies, route stop planning, uh, all your inputs and, and everything you do uh, to spraying and irrigation and that, the pest control, and, uh, and then a 10 year vineyard um, profitability forecaster. I know. <laughs> That's what we do. Any questions yet? And by the way, this, for anybody who does know me, let's, let's have fun, ask, ask questions. Don't, there's no question too small or, um, and especially uh, if there's, you know, the, the, uh, the, 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 two, the two values that we see of these workbooks, one's, one's the most obvious, do the inputs, Factor in, understand your cost of goods, see where you can optimize your profitability, reduce costs, look at thresholds for establishing your selling prices, and so on. Um, so that's, that's the primary application. But also as an educational tool, a lot of tasting room managers don't know how to do uh, a plan. <laughs> they, they don't know what their costs are. They don't even know how to ask and whatever. So, so this is also, uh, these are meant to be used as a team, and we'll talk about how you can share the workbooks with other, other people at your winery and, and, and open up discussion. And, and very importantly, and, and it was really great having Keith in the program yesterday, what to do with, if, who does their own finances in the room, anybody? All right, and you also have a CPA that, that you work with. So, so this is, the, these can be used if you're doing your own calculations and so forth, and they don't replace more detailed finances, 
And a lot of times it, it starts then to beg the questions, how do I get this sort of overriding cost? Because a lot of things we lump in, like winemaking, we just put in what's your cost per ton. And you need to work with your own spreadsheets and whatever to capture what should or shouldn't be included in that and work, work with your, your CPA or bookkeeper or whoever's doing this kind of stuff to be able to, to, to pull that out of, of the, the books that you're keeping, okay? All right, so we're gonna start with uh, understanding cost of goods and that's gonna be two parts in the morning and we're gonna, like say, go through sourcing and cost of grapes, production options and decisions, and then uh, cost of finished wine. Um, what I didn't know when I started this odyssey of, of teaching with this is it all starts with permits and licenses and so on. It's really good to have grapes if you make wine. Uh, you gotta produce them, you've got overhead and operations and admin. You, there needs to be something in the way of sales and marketing, then you've got to have a distribution. And distribution could be anything of, oh, let me take these three cases and wheel them over to the tasting bar in the same room. You're, you know, that's a di distribution. It's amazing how many questions even come up about that and how to account for things and best practices. Um, then you've got a point of sale that could be our, our tasting bar or, or could be, you know, a point of sale in Hong Kong or, or somewhere around the world or around the country. And then the final frontier is the consumer, all right? So as we go through today, I'm, I'll, 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 I'll constantly emphasize critical thinking because in, in every point of this, there's, there's quality decisions and financial implications of those decisions, all right? And so the way we, we look at these is, when you're looking at these decisions, you gotta look at resources and allocation of both time and money. Uh, I know so many people in this industry who have a vision of what they think they're gonna be doing in the wine business. And then they're gonna be growing grapes and they're gonna have a winery and they'll be doing events and going you know, around tasting and pouring their wine. But they end up doing 80% of filling out forms and getting permits and fighting with the county and the city and, and all this kind of stuff, right? Because they, they didn't understand what was needed, so their allocation of time got totally screwed up. Uh, they think that they're gonna be running a winery and, and whatever, but they find out they're pounding the pavement, meeting with distributors and arrogant wine people that are buyers and whatever, and uh, a really good friend of mine in Napa, he found us at 75 years old, you would know the winery, and he and I were having dinner uh, one night, and he said, he said, you know, I'm just so f sick and frickin' tired of this business. I really need out, he actually sold about three years ago. And it, it was, he, he kept his vineyards, because that's what he loves doing. And, but he just got out of the rest of the rat race and, and because he, he couldn't do it all. And he couldn't even work with the vineyards because he, he spent so much time trying to keep the distribution and keep his, his you know, wine in, in the mind's eye of the distributor, et cetera. So um, whether you're a seller or a buyer makes a, a huge difference in how you view the business of grapes, right? The seller wants the highest yield they can possibly extract out of a vineyard at the highest price they could sell it for and the lowest quality possibly that they might be able to get away with, all right? That's very often the case. It's just like if you're a chef and you've got a produce order coming in when you open up the box of tomatoes, you've got sp specifications of what you want for the tomato. And a lot of times the produce guy, this God's honest truth, they'll put the first layer of beautiful, the most ripe, good looking tomatoes with the crap up underneath, right? Uh, so stakeholder perspective, the stakeholders is, is whose interest is it? 
So if it's, if it's the seller that you're talking to, he will have his own interests. If it's the buyer that you're talking to, they will have their own perspective on things. So we're going to, as we go through this, we're, we're going to talk about that you know, in a critical thinking manner. Uh, new thinking versus conventional thinking. There's a book out, and I'm just stating the name of the book. I'll, I'll, we, we actually ended up with a kid in the room, luckily, who had headphones on yesterday. But the book's called On Bullshit. Has anybody heard of that book or read it? Look it up. It's awesome. And, um, and uh, the prime example they use of the most BS riddled industry in, in the US is guess what business? And, and it's really fun. They've got some, some just really great insights. And you may not agree with it or, or whatever, uh, but, but it's, it's really worth looking at. The other thing is, is differentiating. Well, so, so the other thing is I'm working to every, for a lot of people to have new thinking, and especially you know, when we get to the consumer end of things. And, and that, that if, you, if you look at grapes, from the standpoint of the consumer and what, and what their needs are and whatever. A lot of times we assume things about the market. We assume we know what distributors want. And a lot of times we really don't know. Uh, we complain about things like restaurant markups and whatever, but we don't, don't understand what their needs are. So I want to uh, help encourage some new thinking on a number of these topics. Uh, one of the recipes for disaster in this industry is to be a passionate wine enthusiast opening a wine business. Right? You've got to temper that and you've got to moderate that with good business practices and standards and, um, and running a business. And sometimes being able to step out of your enthusiast shoes to say, hey, I've got a business to run here. We've got, got to make this work. Is there any water? Oh, good. Let me get a couple bottles of that. Anybody need any coffee or anything? We got tea and coffee now as well. We got tea and coffee. Anybody want a bottle of water? Yay. And then the, the other thing is um, I do a, 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 a really fun, uh, who's done a wine blending exercise? And, and you add a soup on of this, and you do that, and you usually have it. Who's ever done a wine blending uh, where, where when you're doing the blending, you're all also given a cost of materials, and some of it's $5 a gallon, and some of it's $50 a gallon, and then we don't, yeah, yeah. It's called production, <laughs> right? <laughs> it's actually how you really blend wine. Uh, when we do these workshops, they're really fun. It's a, a whole day kind of a thing. And we do the wine blending, but we also give every, every team has hats. And so somebody's got to wear the winemaker hat. And they're responsible for certain decisions in the team. Somebody's wearing the sales and marketing hat. And so they're saying, hey, you know, I need this story. I need this information. I, I need certain pricing. Somebody else has the financial hat. Oh, great, you want to drop fruit and you want this low yield and this and that. Do you want a bonus? <laughs> because we can't have both. So where, how are we going to meet in this? So, so this, is, this is another part of it is, is, is looking at it from, from the points of view of, and this is basically the, the stakeholders okay, at, at the table. All righty. So today, let's think differently. Try and break up cliches, metaphors, and whatever. Critical thinking. Critical thinking in business standpoint can also be looked at as a SWOT analysis. For a business or an individual, what are the internal strengths and weaknesses? And we love to focus on strengths and avoid even thinking about weaknesses, which is dangerous. And then externally, what are opportunities or threats? On a personal level, it could be in the job market or, or uh, 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 your, your career opportunities or the success of your business. But on a business level for, for a product level, what's out there that you can take advantage of? And what's the long term supply and demand, uh, exchange rates, those kind of things, all right? Um, I will ask the question, who cares? Uh, 
Years and years ago, we were doing a, a round table that was part of an ongoing uh, uh, process at Behringer, and we'd have a, a lot of people in on a very regular basis, look at wine lists, uh, look at what consumers wanted, and uh, at the time, there were some market dynamics that were going on where people were really passionate about AVAs and having the right locale. We now use the word terroir, which very few people actually understand where it comes from or what it means. And so we talk about a lot of stuff with, without asking the, the question, not as resignation like, oh, who cares, but as seriously, who cares? And, and what we found that, is that the gatekeepers, the sommeliers, the buyers and whatever, really cared about origin and AVA, but consumers, for the most part, not so much. Unless they had some link or association to the area that, that was meaningful, then they care. So how many people, of the people who care and don't care, how many are there? How can we get that data? What conversations do we have, need to have and, and not only who cares at, at, the, at, at, at the end game, at the consumer level, but what, what are you providing along the, the, uh, uh, the supply chain at each point of transaction and each point of sale? What do people care about if they're a distributor who's, who's looking at your wine to possibly include it in their portfolio? What do they care about? And it's very, very different from what the, um, what the consumer cares about. And that's why I've got homework for everybody who's going to do their homework. <laughs> Most of you are lying. Um, <laughs> homework is go in, and, and, and we can just sort of recreate this now. We'll consider homework complete. Who's got a cat? Great. And what, what kind of cat food do you feed your cat? Uh, what? Do you have a specific brand that you use or certain criteria? What do you care about? Oh, that they like it. Got it. <laughs> so here's, here's the homework, and I have all my classes do this, and, and I, I used to actually take everybody in, um, uh, to the, the Safeway in St. Helena to do this. We would go into the cat food section and look how they're marketing it. Chef Michael, he's a big deal in the cat world. He's a personal chef to the feline community. And when you see Chef Michael, they'll have the Chesapeake crab cakes and their little, little bits of crab cake. Um, there are other brands. There's a line of pet kitty food pate. You can find salmon bits and on, on the picture, on the cat food can, there will be the piece of salmon and a little sprig of dill. Does the consumer, in this case, give a dang about any of this? No, they don't care. Who cares is the gatekeeper for the cat, and that's who you're actually selling to, so that you can get the product to the actual consumer, and is. It could be just some gray pile of stuff on a plate or even the floor, and they don't care <laughs> as long as it tastes good and as long as they'll eat it, right? So, so part of breaking up the thinking and, and, and who cares is also getting a much better sense of what, if you're trying to get your wine into a, a restaurant or a wine bar or hotel, what do they really care about? Do they care about the same things that you're using to market to the consumer? Very often not. And if it's a distributor, and then if you get with the distributor, you've got distributor salespeople, what do they care about? What does their world look like? What's their perspective, okay? So that's, when I ask who cares, that's what we're gonna talk about. And then consider the alternatives and, and think more deeply on any subject. Uh, if you've got a 6,000 gallon tank, how many barrels would we need over here as an equivalent? It'd be roughly 100 barrels, right? Uh, people look at the cost of a barrel and think that somehow uh, uh, equates directly to the cost of a wine without thinking of the extra labor of the storage 
uh, considerations of maintaining humidity and temperature, of evaporative loss and so forth, of of the moving in and out of barrels. You, you can put this tank outside and, and not even have it covered, but if it, the barrels require an environment and there are all these other considerations. So, so we want to consider alternatives, but also think much more deeply about things. If you're going to drop fruit, you're just knocking it on the ground. So what, what does that do to the cost of the grapes and, and so forth? It will go through different costing models for grapes and what's going on there. Um, uh, I, don't, I don't have, I've actually got a direct picture of this. Everybody remember the earthquake, uh, uh, what was it, four years ago in Napa? Do you remember, Craig? Four years? Uh, five now. F five now? Ooh, God, we <laughs> thought we were gonna die. <laughs> Our, we, we live in a, in a plastic, area uh, at, at Silverado Country Club in a frame house on the second floor. And boy, we thought it was going down. And um, uh, when our power came back on and, and whatever, we had the news on. We were trying to find out what was going on. We're on the internet. And I, I got my phone out just as Cron 4 was showing a video. And, and the video <laughs> was a vineyard where they'd done uh, 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 crop thinning, and they said, and here's the, <laughs> the earthquake was so violent, it knocked the grapes right off the vine. <laughs> we all are subject to this kind of fertilizer. We all are. We get it through education programs are rife with bad information and and cliches and misinterpretations of history and whatever. And when we get to business, really, really smart business people buy wineries and get stupid really quickly, <laughs> all right? Because we jump to conclusions or, or we don't think in a business sense. So, so what we want to do is also m mitigate that today and, and kind of laugh at ourselves a bit, all right. So this is a stakeholder perspective that, that we're going to talk about. So it's just reiterating that. Um, this is a, uh, a really kind of a neat graph. And when, so when we talk about uh, alternatives and considering the alternatives, this is a, a study that was done of an acre of Chardonnay and the gross profit per acre that you could anticipate from a, uh, an acre of grape in Sonoma. Is that, can you guys read that okay? Maybe, maybe turn the yeah, I hate standing in the dark, but I think it will be of benefit. And, and can we get these um, slides afterwards so we've got a full size? Yes, we can send you a, a PDF, yeah. If anybody wants the, P, do you want, want them to just go to me directly or do you want to do it? Yeah, either or. Yeah, so you can email who, whoever is easiest on your, on your drop-down list. And I don't know if I can get this any more clear or not, and I'm afraid to try. So fundamentally what it's saying is uh, uh, a benchmark for profitability is a gross profit of $8,675 uh, uh, per acre. I can't even see this. I think that's like 6.75 uh, tons per acre, uh, the revenue that would generate, et cetera. Um, and then they looked at if, if you vertically integrated another step and actually turned that amount of uh, grapes into uh, Sonoma County bulk wine, what could you sell it for? And at, at the end of the process, taking in all the processing costs and whatever, it's actually about a 15% increase in your re return on, on your uh, gross profit, which is pretty significant. The other more fascinating thing was that they then looked at um, this district and, and grape grapes versus bulk wine. And you can see there's, there's virtually a, a, a an opposite correlation in conditions of supply and demand. 
And so the, the conclusion of this is for Sonoma growers who, who would like to consider it, not only can you increase your, um, your gross profit significantly, but you might actually want to do half grapes and, and half conversion into bulk wine. Uh, and you can actually level out then uh, and kind of mitigate the supply demand shifts that, that can be really significant. So just kind of a cool alternative to consider in the business of grapes. Um, raises an awful lot of issue of you know, who you're contracted with and how much you want to engage in, because again, now your time and allocation of, of resources and tension is going to be significantly impacted, but it's, it's um, it's kind of a neat way to look at it. All right. Of course, we've got the grape supply chain and, and, and then understanding grapes as a business and how, uh, how often misrepresented and, and inflated uh, the things that we learn and the things that we're teaching sommeliers and, and uh, uh, wine educators and whatever about the struggling low yield vines. Uh, Craig, what's the highest yield of uh, Cabernet you've ever seen in Napa Valley? Highest? Yeah. Eight to nine. Eight to nine. Yeah. I, we found a transaction in Rutherford, uh, 14 tons per acre. Yeah. At, at a premium and, and actually at one of the most famous vineyards in, in the area. Uh, one of my favorite fishing ponds was in Oakville, um, stocked with really great bass and whatever. And, and you could just hear the, the tour guides, oh, our struggling, low-yielding vines. And this stuff was this double canopy loaded to the gills, it just total, total fertilizer. And those, and, and those growers were selling it. And in the 14-ton in the per acre transaction, it was 30% premium above average selling price uh, for Napa Valley fruit, which would put it at, right now, about 10 grand <laughs> per, per ton. You know, at 14 tons. Hmm. <laughs> so, I mean, you've, you've got everything in a grape supply chain from, from a site, negotiating the real estate, the planning, the layout, the prep, all the things that you have to do. Uh, and again, we're going to have, have a workbook for all of this. Uh, you get all your upfront costs, you've got your costs of, of the real estate, you've got debt service, you've got all these things to consider. Um, why do they plant the different varieties in Bordeaux that they plant? Is it to create this harmonious marriage? And no, it's business. <laughs> and if, if you get frost in your, your vineyard site, and some areas are much more prone to frost, uh, basically you don't want Merlot because it buds roughly 30 days before Cabernet does. And if you get frost, it's stupid to plant Merlot in a frost-prone place. Uh, if you plant Cabernet, you get the advantage of often not having bud break and so on until after more of the frost risk is mitigated. But now you're more prone to the rains and, and problems at the end of the harvest. So having 50-50 is a good business decision. Or having different varieties that ripen at different times is a good business decision. And if you've actually planned it out pretty well in most vintages, you can, you can, can minimize the amount of capital expenditure in the tanks and fermentation processing because you've, you've sort of graduated when the grapes come in a bit. And um, so, so sometimes you can get away with less upfront costs and maintenance and that kind of stuff. One of the biggest things that turned out is um, historically uh, vineyards in, in Bordeaux and throughout France count on gypsies or, or people from certain villages. And in Bordeaux, it's usually Spanish of a Spanish town and families will service and come for harvest uh, every year at the same uh, uh, chateau or property, and, and uh, uh, they were notorious uh, some time ago as, as being unruly and uh, being gypsies. Uh, and if you could have a smaller group of people for a longer period of employment, it was advantageous 
more advantageous than getting a lot of people for a short period. I didn't know that till I went and, and actually talked to some, some uh, winery owners and growers in Bordeaux about that. It was kind of fascinating. But it's, it's all a matter of business and supply chain and, and cost. So um, let's go on into the wine biz sim. And this is what it looks like when you get there, all right? Uh, let's see, we are not getting the whole screen, are we here? Hang on a second. Let me reconfigure this just a little bit. Can we see everything now? Good. Okay. Train's coming. So, um, the, the program, the workbooks that we're going to introduce, basically, uh, it's a, it, information is on a server. I'm going to take you into how to log in, uh, how to save projects, and what you need to know about these workbooks, okay? So you should have received an email and uh, to whatever um, email was used to sign up with the Oregon Wine Board. And the system auto-generates a password. Did everybody get their password and sign on that, that I know you haven't gotten yours yet, but everybody else get this okay? It, it, and if you didn't, check your spam filter because uh, it's auto-generated from the system, so it, it automatically sends it back, so a lot of times it gets flagged as, but it, it'll come from spreadsheetconverter.com um, and it'll give you the ability to input your, your email is your, um, uh, is your username, all right? Can someone say in American the password for the Wi-Fi? Carpenter, Carpenter Bill. Bill. Thank you. <laughs> Sorry. Everyone looked at me the same way when I said it the first time. Sorry. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, in a very, that's right. <laughs> if you didn't, if you uh, if you know you were set up and you got your confirmation letter, you can also just simply go to forgot your password, put in your email address, and it'll it'll send you your password. So that's that's a workaround. Or if you ever forget it, so it's it's really easy to get in and out of it. And basically, it asks you then to sign in. And you're going to be faced with this pull down here. And it says, select a form from the drop down list. And when you go to this drop down, this is, uh, there's an important sequence here. Uh, but you'll see we've got uh, the cost of goods calculator, portfolio, marketing sales calculator, and wine pricing. Okay. And so we're, we're going to start with the cost of goods calculator um, for this morning, all right? Uh, there will also, since we're debugging and, and, and getting things, if everything works great today, then get started on, on projects. But if, if we're still finding some bugs, you'll want to maybe hold off until we send a notice to everybody that, hey, we've got the new forms up. And, and you'll see a date that'll, that'll give you uh, which, which version we've got up. And you'll notice uh, two of these were um, updated at 5 o'clock this friggin' morning by a guy who hates spreadsheets. All right. So what we're going to do is I'm going to select that form. And then another thing to notice is underneath, you're going to see all this gibberish and whatever, but there's going to be a list of the forms that I've created from this, all right? Uh, there's another way we want you to save your information, but if for any reason you've been working on a workbook and you can't find it, it's usually because you, uh, you lost the URL. So I'm going to create a new form. So once you select a form, you always uh, have to hit new when you're starting a new workbook, all right? And then that gets you in. Does that make sense? Now, this is not on your computer. This is on the server. 
And so the ability to save and recall projects is very important to understand the process of favorites or bookmarking. Does anybody not know how to do a favorite or a bookmark? Okay, all right. So basically, here's another thing. If, if you're doing this at work on your desktop or whatever, and then you want to work on it at home or on another computer or share it with somebody else, you need to, sh to share the URL up here, all right, this information, because this is actually how you get back to an active workbook. All right, it's not saved on your computer. So you can email this to yourself, put it in your notes or something, but you need to find a way to capture it so that you can get back to a project that you're working on. Does that make sense? All right. If you're working on a workbook that's important to you, you really want to put your name in, in the wine name uh, for this project. What we're going to do is we're going to work on the cost of goods of a single wine. All right. And I'm actually going to, everybody talk among yourselves. Let's, we're, we're getting some people set up and, and, and I want to make sure everybody's got this and can pay attention. So this colored field, you can input information. And when you don't have that color field, it's doing automatic calculations for you, all right? So as an example, when you, now uh, let me go through a, a couple things at the top here. Auto filter is where you find the list of forms to create your workbooks. Is that oh, is it? When you're working on it, if you put on your glasses, Okay, so the save button means that I'm, I'm actually in the edit mode and I can actually select to keep a project in the edit mode, all right? Um, so if it says save, when I save it, then it'll activate the auto filter. There we go. And the auto filter is then where you find the pull down for new projects. And remember, once you, you pick the project, if you're starting a new project, you hit new. So this is the way you create a new project. And every time you create a new project, you want to uh, put in information, save it, and bookmark it, all right? So that you can get back to it, all right? So putting in your name here, and date is a, a pull down kind of thing. Where are we? It must be Medford. Uh, Name for this is Medford Blend and Vintage. Um, we're going to make 3,000 cases of this wine. Uh, this is an FOB um, uh, user site, so you get to put in a projected FOB. Now you'll be able to go back and change it. It's going to auto-generate, and, and at the very end we'll get to the, the assumptions to auto-generate an MSRP, or, or actually an, an, an average selling price uh, for this wine. It's gonna give us, it's gonna reiterate our FOB, tell us then the total revenue FOB times case production, going to keep track of our cost of goods, uh, give us a gross margin per case. Um, it'll it'll pre-calculate a, a, just a, a guideline for a selling price, uh, how many tons are required to make this wine, the cost of your grapes, and then your total gross margin. So this is kind of the, the front page dashboard. Okay. And then, so if we want it, so as an example, once we got everything input, and by the way, each workbook has pre, is preloaded with, with data so that you can see that it's already functioning and then you go in and change things, all right? So if, if we know roughly that for our red blend, we really want it to be $180 FOB, we put in $180, and you can see what it did to our selling price. Um, into our, our margins and our, our, uh, our revenue, okay? That makes sense? 
So in grape costs, this is where we need to reiterate over and over again, fill out surveys, help us with data, and we can update information. This is, this, this is designed so that we can find a bug and, and sometimes I can even fix it, maybe. Uh, but, but we're very dynamic with this. Now, if you started a workbook and uh, we do an update, for that workbook, you'll be working on the old workbook until you re-enter the data into the new version. So, so wait a week or so before you dive, play around with this, get used to it, see who else you want to share and go over with it, uh, but hold off on, on, on going whole hog into it for about another week so that we can continue to get it debugged and, and tested and so forth. And we're just about there. On the top of every page, all right, so you've got, these are your tabs, and we refer to them as sheet one, sheet two, and then what they, they roughly cover. And so this is a great cost. Um, this is a mini dashboard that'll be at the top of every page. So as you go through, you can actually watch, watch what's happening to your costs of goods, to your gross margin in, uh, by case and your total gross margin, all right? So as we change inputs down here and run scenarios, we can watch the changes here, but we can also go back to the bigger dashboard at the front, or we can go back to a, co a more complete cost breakdown at the end that we'll get to. Does that make sense? So you've got these dynamic fields. So for example, if I say, well, for my Pinot Noir, I can get that at $2,000 a ton, and we'll go through how all this works and what it means. So if I go in here and change this to 2,000, watch what it does in lowering my uh, cost of goods, improving my margin, et cetera. So there's kind of an immediate feedback uh, loop on this to, to playing with different scenarios and so forth. Um, and the total gross margin, that's directly related to the estimated retail selling No. See, and, and this is, this, this is, this is going to become a, real, a, a more important issue. We are talking about establishing an FOB price that is the selling price from the winery to a distributor to direct to account, however, however you're doing it. And that also in your tasting room and wine club, even if your distribution is I'm taking three cases here and taking it over to the tasting bar, there should be a, an established transfer price, which we recommend be the FOB price, so that you can run profitability of your winery separate from your tasting room business unit, whether it's just on paper or not, okay? So the gross margin we're looking at is, is the per case differential between your cost of finished goods and your FOB ex seller's pricing, okay? And, and what we did with that retail price, that's just a guideline at the very end, the very last workbook we're going to do is actually a full-blown cost calculator putting in scenarios for your tasting room, for your wine club, for um, uh, US distribution, three tier, and also for export. So you can actually look at those numbers in a much more realistic detail. And actually, I'll just, I'll just jump right to the end on that since we're there. So this, um, this retail price that we've got here that's auto-calculated is actually on the very last page in the cost breakdown at the bottom. And <laughs> don't let a dyslexic, ADHD-riddled master of wine do corrections. <laughs> I put the O in to provide. <laughs> <laughs> Poor vide. <laughs> I, I write an email that says, hey, Craig, how have you been? And then I've got to take five minutes going back correcting every word. <laughs> so anyways, so, so, so 
On the front page, that retail price, basically what we've done is we take your FOB and we look at your total winery revenue, but we, we have a whole separate work, worksheet that automatically adds uh, freight insurance and taxes on a national benchmark average, times a 1.5 markup by the distributor. So we've got the distributor landed cost times a, a, a standard markup, and then times a 1.33 markup, 25% margin for, the, for a retail. And that, that gives you then your estimated retail selling price. All right, so this is just a fantasy number, just si sort of as a guideline to see the impact of decisions on, on selling price. Does that make sense? Let me get my notebook out so I can record. Provide, not provide. All right. Known issues. Yeah, no kid. I mean, no kidding. I mean, seriously, and we wouldn't have to make all our spreadsheets. <laughs> yeah. Yeah, I know. I'm thinking how that works. <laughs> and 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 you still need and and you probably still need spreadsheets and and you need more details. But when you when you really want to just plug numbers in and and you're envisioning a new wine and say, well, let's run the numbers on it. Uh, we were. T we were talking, somebody was, made the remark yesterday, he said, oh my God, this is gonna be so great when I sit down with the owners and they're coming up with these wild ass things, why don't we do this? I can say, well, here's the numbers. Because <laughs> you can literally, when you get familiar with this, you can, you can run the scenarios in minutes. Um, and, and to that point, I'm sorry, I, I left out a couple things in the, on the top here. So, so let's say that I, I've, I've done our 2014 red blend here. And, and I've got that all set up and I've got my numbers. And, and I, wanna, I wanna run a scenario of the same wine and look at a lot of different parameters. Um, I can save this and then um, when I save it, it'll give me the ability to clone it. All right, see the clone here? So I can, can clone it. Now when I clone it, I need to save it and, and that URL, again, will be to the clone version of it. And so I'll want to do something in the name also, possibly, that it says Medford Blend 2014 version 2 or, or something like that. Does that make sense? The other thing I can do is if I want to start forecasting for the 2015, I know that maybe grape prices are going up or coming down. Maybe yields are changing, and uh, that we're going to make some changes in the barrel regimen and whatever. I can take this wine once I've set it up, clone it, name the clone 2015, and and start forecasting and putting numbers in in for that as well. So this this clone. Uh, uh, hit sa so you need to hit. Does does this say save right here? Are you in the auto save mode? It, no. Okay. I had it in edit mode. Yeah. So. You can't keep it in an edit mode to clone it. Correct. So you, you've got to save it before you clone it. So, so it, it, yeah. And then when you want to work on it again, when you want to edit it, hit the edit button. Because right now, and this, this is actually, a, uh, happens to me all the time. Notice it's giving me a you can't do anything sign. All right. Uh, so I, I can't edit my fields. That, oh, that's right. I've got to go and hit the the edit button, and now I now I can get back to work on it. So if if you if you find you're stuck and you and and you're trying to input fields, it's it's all almost always the save or edit button that you need to uh, to take a look at. All right. The OG. Typo S7 provide. Yay. All right. We got that. All right. 
So let's go back to grave costs. And by the way, there is a bookmark function on the pages, but I, I always use my own favorites or, or, or you know, for whatever uh, browser Safari or whatever you have. I use the one that's actually the little star up in the corner. And you can create folders also over time as you're saving projects. You'll notice you'll, have, you, you'll hopefully have a whole bunch of different projects, but you could have a folder for all your cost of goods, a folder for for the marketing and sales and so on if, and whatever. Uh, and you could even further break it down, cost of goods, buy types of wines. So you can manage the, the, the different versions that you're creating. Okie dokie. Now here's what, here's what we find really fun. If you notice, we get to put in a cost per ton. That can be a known cost, a projected cost. Um, and you put, if it's going to be a blend, you can put up to eight different wine uh, sources in it. I think it's eight, seven or eight. It's eight. Um, and so we're, we're able, now when we select from the pull down, when you select Pinot Noir, it's gonna give you the Oregon average cost per ton, low, high, and Highlighted. Oh, is it? When you're working on it, if you put on your glasses, okay, so the save button means that I'm, I'm actually in the edit mode and I can actually select to keep a project in the edit mode, all right? Um, so if it says save, when I save it, then it'll activate the auto filter. There we go. And the auto filter is then where you find the pull down for new projects. And remember, once you, you pick the project, if you're starting a new project, you hit new. So this is the way you create a new project. And every time you create a new project, you want to uh, put in information, save it, and bookmark it, all right? So that you can get back to it, all right? So putting in your name here, and date is a, a pull down kind of thing. Where are we? It must be Medford. Uh, Name for this is Medford Blend and Vintage. Um, we're going to make 3,000 cases of this wine. Uh, this is an FOB um, uh, user site, so you get to put in a projected FOB. Now you'll be able to go back and change it. It's going to auto-generate, and, and at the very end we'll get to the, the assumptions to auto-generate an MSRP, or, or actually an, an, an average selling price uh, for this wine. It's gonna give us, it's gonna reiterate our FOB, tell us then the total revenue FOB times case production, going to keep track of our cost of goods, uh, give us a gross margin per case. Um, it'll it'll pre-calculate a, a, just a, a guideline for a selling price, uh, how many tons are required to make this wine, the cost of your grapes, and then your total gross margin. So this is kind of the, the front page dashboard. Okay. And then, so if we want it, so as an example, once we got everything input, and by the way, each workbook has pre, is preloaded with, with data so that you can see that it's already functioning and then you go in and change things, all right? So if, if we know roughly that for our red blend, we really want it to be $180 FOB, we put in $180, and you can see what it did to our selling price. Um, into our, our margins and our, our, uh, our revenue, okay? That makes sense? So in grape costs, this is where we need to reiterate over and over again, fill out surveys, help us with data, and we can update information. This is, this, this is designed so that we can find a bug and, and sometimes I can even fix it 
maybe. Uh, but, but we're very dynamic with this. Now, if you started a workbook and uh, we do an update, for that workbook, you'll be working on the old workbook until you re-enter the data into the new version. So, so wait a week or so before you dive, play around with this, get used to it, see who else you want to share and go over with it, uh, but hold off on, on, on going whole hog into it for about another week so that we can continue to get it debugged and, and tested and so forth. And we're just about there. On the top of every page, all right, so you've got, these are your tabs, and we refer to them as sheet one, sheet two, and then what they, they roughly cover. And so this is a great cost. Um, this is a mini dashboard that'll be at the top of every page. So as you go through, you can actually watch, watch what's happening to your costs of goods, to your gross margin in, uh, by case and your total gross margin, all right? So as we change inputs down here and run scenarios, we can watch the changes here, but we can also go back to the bigger dashboard at the front, or we can go back to a, co a more complete cost breakdown at the end that we'll get to. Does that make sense? So you've got these dynamic fields. So for example, if I say, well, for my Pinot Noir, I can get that at $2,000 a ton, and we'll go through how all this works and what it means. So if I go in here and change this to 2,000, watch what it does in lowering my uh, cost of goods, improving my margin, et cetera. So there's kind of an immediate feedback uh, loop on this to, to playing with different scenarios and so forth. Um, and the total gross margin, that's directly related to the estimated retail selling No. See, and, and this is this, this is this is going to become a real a, a more important issue. We are talking about establishing an FOB price that is the selling price from the winery to a distributor to direct to account, however however you're doing it, and that also in your tasting room and wine club, even if your distribution is I'm taking three cases here and taking it over to the tasting bar, there should be a, an established transfer price, which we recommend be the FOB price, so that you can run profitability of your winery separate from your tasting room business unit, whether it's just on paper or not, okay? So the gross margin we're looking at is, is the per case differential between your cost of finished goods and your FOB ex seller's pricing, okay? And, and what we did with that retail price, that's just a guideline. At the very end, the very last workbook we're going to do is actually a full-blown cost calculator putting in scenarios for your tasting room, for your wine club, for um, uh, U.S. distribution, three-tier, and also for export. So you can actually look at those numbers in a much more realistic detail. And actually, I'll just, I'll just jump right to the end on that since we're there. So this, um, this retail price that we've got here that's auto-calculated is actually on the very last page in the cost breakdown at the bottom. And <laughs> don't let a dyslexic, ADHD-riddled master of wine do corrections. <laughs> I put the O in to provide. <laughs> <laughs> Poor vide. <laughs> I, I write an email that says, hey, Craig, how have you been? And then I've got to take five minutes going back correcting every word. <laughs> so anyways, so, so, so on the front page, that retail price, basically what we've done is we take your FOB, and we look at your total winery revenue, but we, we have a whole separate work, worksheet that automatically adds uh, freight insurance and taxes on a national 
benchmark average times a 1.5 markup by the distributor. So we've got the distributor landed cost times a, a, a standard markup and then times a 1.33 markup, 25% margin for the for a retail. And that, that gives you then your estimated retail selling price. All right, so this is just a fantasy number, just si sort of as a guideline to see the impact of decisions on, on selling price. Does that make sense? Let me get my notebook out so I can record. Provide, not provide. All right. Known issues. Yeah, no kid. I mean, no kidding. I mean, seriously, and we wouldn't have to make all our spreadsheets. <laughs> yeah. Yeah, I know. I'm thinking how that works. <laughs> and 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 you still need and and you probably still need spreadsheets and and you need more details. But when you when you really want to just plug numbers in and and you're envisioning a new wine and say, well, let's run the numbers on it. Uh, we were. T we were talking, somebody was, made the remark yesterday, he said, oh my God, this is gonna be so great when I sit down with the owners and they're coming up with these wild ass things, why don't we do this? I can say, well, here's the numbers. Because <laughs> you can literally, when you get familiar with this, you can, you can run the scenarios in minutes. Um, and, and to that point, I'm sorry, I, I left out a couple things in the, on the top here. So, so let's say that I, I've, I've done our 2014 red blend here. And, and I've got that all set up and I've got my numbers. And, and I, wanna, I wanna run a scenario of the same wine and look at a lot of different parameters. Um, I can save this and then um, when I save it, it'll give me the ability to clone it. All right, see the clone here? So I can, can clone it. Now when I clone it, I need to save it and, and that URL, again, will be to the clone version of it. And so I'll want to do something in the name also, possibly, that it says Medford Blend 2014 version 2 or, or something like that. Does that make sense? The other thing I can do is if I want to start forecasting for the 2015, I know that maybe grape prices are going up or coming down. Maybe yields are changing, and uh, that we're going to make some changes in the barrel regimen and whatever. I can take this wine once I've set it up, clone it, name the clone 2015, and and start forecasting and putting numbers in in for that as well. So this this clone. Uh, uh, hit sa so you need to hit. Does does this say save right here? Are you in the auto save mode? It, no. Okay. I had it in edit mode. Yeah. So. You can't keep it in an edit mode. To clone it. Correct. So you, you've got to save it before you clone it. So, so it, it, yeah. And then when you want to work on it again, when you want to edit it, hit the edit button. Because right now, and this, this is actually, a, uh, happens to me all the time. Notice it's giving me a, you can't do anything sign. All right. Uh, so I, I can't edit my fields. That, oh, that's right. I've got to go and hit the the edit button, and now I now I can get back to work on it. So if if you if you find you're stuck and you and and you're trying to input fields, it's it's all almost always the save or edit button that you need to uh, to take a look at. All right. The OG. Typo S7 provide. Yay. All right. We got that. All right. So let's go back to grave costs. And by the way, there is a bookmark function on the pages, but I, I always use my own favorites or, or, or you know, for whatever uh, browser Safari or whatever you have, I use the one 
that's actually the little star up in the corner. And you can create folders also over time as you're saving projects. You'll notice you'll have, you, you'll hopefully have a whole bunch of different projects, but you could have a folder for all your cost of goods, a folder for, for the marketing and sales and so on if, and whatever. Uh, and you could even further break it down, cost of goods, buy types of wines. So you can manage the, the, the different versions that you're creating. Okie dokie. Now here's what, here's what we find really fun. If you notice, we get to put in a cost per ton. That can be a known cost, a projected cost. Um, and you put, if it's going to be a blend, you can put up to eight different wine uh, sources in it. I think it's eight, seven or eight. It's eight. Um, and so we're, we're able, now when we select from the pull down, when you select Pinot Noir, it's gonna give you the Oregon average cost per ton, low, high, and average by North Willamette, South Willamette, Umpqua, Rogue, and Columbia River. Yay. Uh, we don't have a lot of data for a lot of grapes. <laughs> so if you wanted to say, well, what is it for Syrah? All right, we go into this, we collect it, and notice there's no data for South and North Willamette, but we've got it for, for the other AVAs. So what we're, what we're and there, there are a lot of grapes that there's no data. It's just NA all the way across because uh, uh, the, the crush report's not very, very detailed or robust. Uh, as that gets updated, and again, this is going to be with salary surveys, we'll either have links to the information that I'll show you in a minute, or we'll actually input the benchmarks directly into the program wherever possible. So uh, for our red blend, uh, I will just leave the Syrah at $2,000 a ton, but let's, what do we want to blend with our Syrah? How about some Grenache? And notice there's no data available, so help us. Um, what are we going to pay a ton for our Grenache? 1800 And what percentage do we want in our blend? 50-50. So when I enter this, the one thing I do want to make sure is to adjust so that this red number up here is 100%. So some people run scenarios and say, oh my god, and then they find out they've got five varieties each at 100%. Uh, so make sure to, to have your, your value. And then what it's going to do um, is uh, to, again, We've got our cost per ton, it's 50%, so this is the cost uh, by percentage of blend for that variety, okay? And in this case, the math's kind of easy uh, to run. If you wanted to throw in um, some other things into here, you know, you, you can pick and choose, and then uh, if you've got varieties that aren't on the pull down, you just simply enter them in the last two. Now, the other thing is if you're make, you may be making a, a, a Pinot Noir from several different vineyard sources at different costs, and you can actually then do all Pinot Noir, put in the differing price per ton and what percentage uh, you're expecting as a contribution to the blend, and run that also. So it could, could run um, multiple vineyard single variety scenarios also, okay? And then, as we're doing this, it's also telling us the effect of these decisions of cost of grapes on our cost of goods and our gross margin, okay? Um, and again, you can, you can do reds, you can do whites. We've, we've, uh, it gets kind of a little addictive also, like what is the price of Tanat? And you'll find there's actually no data, but um, uh, over time we'll have that, okay? <laughs> yeah, yeah. And look at some of the stuff that we have. We we actually have data that that, that people are growing, you know, uh, Vermentino and Trousseau Noir and and Godello and stuff like that. But um, 
but and, you know, but if you go to those varieties, you'll you'll find out there's a paucity of Im information. Um, so, so what what's really fun is also that you can run the scen scenario if 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 you've got a source that somebody's saying, hey, you know, I've got some Syrah available at eight hundred dollars a ton, and say, wow, okay, if it meets your quality uh, 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 parameters and so on. Yeah, you know, might be worth a consideration, and if it's good enough, maybe we're going to run with 80% Syrah this year, right? So you really get to make run these scenarios. It's easy to input. You see what the implication is for for your bottom line, and uh, and off you go. Yeah. So let's say that we decided to do Syrah, and that somebody said we've got some Syrah available for 800 bucks. So we go back down, and we could create a another. Uh, line item for Syrah at 800 bucks. Oops. Oh, great. All right, inputs on cost. Input. Everyone who registered and should have received will be in there now. And so if you haven't received it, So, so right now, our gross margin per case is 88.32, about $265,000. So if, 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 if we found a, a source for, for some Syrah and said, okay, let's knock our Grenache, let's, and, and, and this is where the reality of blending comes in. Let's try the, you know, if, if, you, if you've got this, we're also gonna show you, you can input bulk wine or, or existing material in, into all of this. But you, but you get to say okay let's let's see what what that would look like and and how that would work so so we're going to knock our Grenache down we're going to add uh, we're going to make 50 percent of this really great Syrah we got from this new source and then we need to knock this eighteen hundred dollar a ton uh, down to um, twenty percent and so we're making almost ten dollars a case. Uh, greater margin per case, and that translates from 265, almost $30,000 more for our 3,000 cases. Okay, so. And so, what's the um, sort of lineage if you are you're growing if it's your own fruit? So is that like you are buying it from the vineyards? Yes. Yes, and that's exactly the kind of questions we started to really get into yesterday. Best practice is to ensure that you run your vineyard as a business, as a separate business unit, even if it's only on paper. Many times it's advantageous to set it up as its own company because you, if, if you're growing your own, one of, one of the great fertilizer things, oh, it's, it's best to have an estate, grow your own, because you've got control and the grapes are cheaper. <laughs> uh, that control means also if something goes haywire, you're stuck with it, and you've either got to lose your estate designation if that's a selling point, so you've got a marketing decision. If, if, if it's crap fruit and something went wrong and, and you can't outsource for other fruit, because again, you, you lose the marketing edge and the, and the brand, you know, uh, the, 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 the product that you've built on an estate uh, platform. Um, and beyond that, uh, there are times when operating a, an agricultural business at a loss has significant tax advantages. There, there are funds from, from USDA and, and ag, uh, uh, marketing dollars and whatever. And so you can actually set up to have the, the transaction from your vineyard to your winery at a loss. 
Uh, in the California Grape Crush Report, one of the really fun things, if you know who the players are, and, and you know certain vineyards and whatever, you, uh, 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 high price for Napa uh, Cabernet Sauvignon, almost 10 tons. What do you think the, the highest price paid for Napa fruit was, Cabernet Sauvignon was last year? How many dollars a ton? <laughs> $50,000 <laughs> a ton. Tokelon. Hmm? Tokelon. Yep, Tokelon, Andy Beckstoffer. Now, there are other numbers like that that are actually just actually a facade because it might have been adv advantageous to lose money in the winery and, and have an inflated transfer price. And, and so you're not really sure exactly how the cost basis was used for the grapes in the transaction, but it's every legal transaction is in there. And we'll get to the pricing. Well, actually, we can, we'll, we'll talk about this at, at, at the end, the pricing model, but, but let me give you, give you how, how $50,000 is arrived at for Beckstoff or Tokelon fruit. Uh, hey, and I'd really like some of your fruit. Oh, that's great, okay, stand in line. And right now, the cost basis is uh, whatever. So, so first of all, it's stipulated this needs to be called Tokelon Cabernet Single Vineyard. All right, that's part of the, the negotiated contract. And whatever the retail selling price that the producer who's buying the fruit has established for a bottle of their wine times 175 equals the cost per ton. <laughs> Let me go over that again. You want to buy my fruit, you're going to sell the finished wine at $100 a bottle. It's going to cost you $17.50 a ton. The bottle price times $175. What this means, if you know how to interpret the data and whatever, is somebody bought Beckstoffer fruit, 10 tons of it, to sell at $300 a bottle. Thus, they paid $50,000. This is a whole new pricing model. It is like insanity, and people are fighting. And, and, the, and, and not long ago, it was 100 times the bottle price. Now it's 175. So if you want the fruit, you've got to go and say, hey, Andy, I'll pay you 200 times my bottle price of $300. And Andy's a businessman. <laughs> yes, he is. <laughs> And a really great grower uh, and a smart guy. So, yeah, so I mean, so, so do, does that answer your question in, in, in depth? Yeah, so, and, and, and that's when, when we get to the FOB pricing and whatever, your winery has to have a basis to run and to understand the profitability. You need to know uh, to separate that from tasting room sales and retail sales and, and, and everything else. And, and how much are you going to have then in your, in your, in your gross margin to then uh, budget for labor and equipment and reinvestment and, and bonuses and that kind of stuff, okay? So uh, in the business of grapes, you get to run all these fun scenarios and play with it and put in all sorts of different things. And uh, if you want to co-ferment some Viognier with your Syrah, plug it on in and um, have a field day. All right. So then we get to production. Now, a critical number is you've got a ton of grapes how many cases are you going to forecast that you get per ton of grapes for this type of wine? So the next calculator is what we call a, well, actually, there, there's two things. I'm sorry, getting ahead of, so we're going to have a stepper, which is the con conversion rate of how many cases you squeeze out of a ton of fruit, all right? And then we're going to get into a, to the production and so on from there. But we also have the ability, if you've got existing material that's already fermented and you know the cost of the wine in your inventory that you might want to add into a blend, or if you're playing the bulk wine uh, market, which is huge and vibrant and, and 
Bulk wine does not mean cheap wine or bad wine or inexpensive wine. Uh, in the whisper market of the bulk wine business is extraordinary wine sometimes. There's, there's some amazing stuff out there, okay? And there's crap. So it's like it, it's a whole art and so science. And you can actually use this, um, this converter and completely forego the, if you, if you step this up to 100%, uh, you can actually run a complete bulk wine s scenario, all right? So, so let's say for all intent and purpose, we're going to use 10% uh, of bulk wine or existing material that we already have. So we've got to look down at uh, line 19. And in line 19, we get to enter a bulk wine cost of, per gallon. We've got that preset at 35, but you can step that up or down. Now, it won't have any effect on profitability right now because we got 0% of bulk wine in our blend. So let's step that up. Boy, this is slow. And notice as we step this up, it's reducing the whole grape uh, uh, cost. I'm sorry, the numbers in here because we're reducing our grape needs because we're using bulk wine for the same production level. All right, so we're gonna take our cost per ton of grapes. We're going to take how much bulk, all or none, and anywhere in between, and then the final thing is going to be what's our conversion rate, and that's gonna then tell us how many tons we need, what's the total cost of grapes, and then as contribution to our cost of finished wine, uh, how much that corresponds to in relationship to a case of product. So you're talking with your winemaker and you say, you know, what's our conversion rate? How many cases are, are, are we getting out of a ton? They might not know, but they usually do, right, Craig? And, and then you can have the conversation say, you know, if, if, if we wanted to squeeze a little bit more, let me watch this up here, and then as we squeeze a little bit more and watch your profits rise, some people only get 50 um, cases per ton. And notice what that does to our margins and, and so on. So it, this is an immediate feedback. Uh, if you're looking at a new press, and a, a better technology that you can, can process faster and you can maintain quality but get more out of each pressing, then you can actually use this to see what it does to your margin. Does that justify the new capital investment for the, the cost of the press, et cetera, et cetera. Uh, when the winemaker's looking at it from this perspective, you say, Watch up here, this is directly proportionate to your bonus. <laughs> so you, you can actually have those conversations as well as uh, about that kind of stuff, okay? And we actually have this set up to go down to very low yields for things like ice wine and specialty wines where you're getting really, really low conversion rates. Or it might be vintage specific, like in 2011 it was just, the, the fruit was this soppy, you know, mess of stuff in, in a lot of cases, in California especially, and, and conversion rates were really low. So you, you, you had to deal with lower quality of fruit, lower conversion, and then you need more fruit to be able to, to satisfy the production demand. Any questions on that? And actually that wasn't a problem. Okay, fixed. All right. Now, this is um, a large assumption. And this, uh, remember I mentioned the black holes. You, you start to say, well, you've got these parameters and these inputs and they affect this, this, and that. To keep this manageable, what we've done is the winemaking, fermentation and production per ton, excluding aging and cellaring, is done as a cost per ton basis. This is what custom crush facilities use. Uh, 
working with your accountant or your existing books, you can determine what goes into this. Now, tip, we're, later we're gonna have an operations workbook and labor and all this kind of stuff. So for all intent and purpose, this could be just the processing uh, 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 general costs, uh, but it, uh, it says not including labor and overhead. Usually it will, all right? Um, and so this is, this is all of the costs to, that go into, and, and let's say that you do have a challenging uh, vintage, you've got more sorting, you've got to buy a piece of equipment or send, you know, get something done to the, to the grapes or the wine, you're gonna use flash detente or, or reverse osmosis or something like that. You can put in exceptional costs, you can put an average cost of processing per ton, um, you get to uh, also put any uh, lab work and, and so forth. If, if, so you take all your lab fees, divide it by all the cases of, of your wine, you know, supplies and, and services and whatever, and come up with a, an allocated cost for, for each of the wines. You plug that in, and then that'll give you your total production cost per ton. So this is a, an assumption-rich field if you are doing custom crush, your, your, your per ton might include your aging and cellaring, so you just don't do that, that section. You put in what your bill was for, for the processing, the aging, and everything else. That makes sense? So, so this, is, this is a catch-all, but it's really important to, to start to get a handle on what is your production cost and so forth. So when we were, when we were talking to Keith and some of the other people in the accounting, um, you basically sit down with, with your books and you look at the, the line items that would be included in your production costs and, and labor and all that kind of stuff. And then you divide that out by the different wine types and then you come up, we, we process this many tons, our production costs include or don't include these things, and then you come up with that average production cost. You may then weigh it a little differently. You know, Pinot Noir may be much more labor intensive and you need specialized equipment for that and you didn't need it so much for another variety. All right, does that make sense? All right, but again, it's, it, it, it it gets you, and this is where the conversation with the accountant, with the winemaker and whatever, and working together on a workbook where you can actually put it on a large screen or a projector or whatever and sit down and say, hey, what, what's our number here? Okay, any questions about that? Is it the fault to eight hundred above? Pardon? Is it the fault to eight hundred Yeah, we just got that plugged in there. We have no freaking clue. <laughs> I mean, it's a good idea. We've talked to, uh, you know, Jeff Birch and, um, and production people, and then we've also uh, talked to a number of people that, again, the key is we're trying to get the numbers for Oregon. Um, and, uh, so hopefully in the future we'll maybe have, be able to have a drop-down menu that you know, has a production size next to that or something that gives you the yeah. benchmarking average, but at the moment we're still gathering. Yes, and as I'll sh we'll get to some pages that we sometimes there's too much information to put in a, a drop down or something, so we'll actually create a page and a link to the page when we get to taxes. So we could actually come up with, with different scenarios based on different size of production and winery and are you a part of an, AP, an alternating proprietorship or do you own all your own equipment and this and that or are you doing, so we can come up with estimated so that you can use those as guidelines and benchmarks. Or, yeah, right. you process your food and your biodynamic yeah. winery, your, what are committed. Exactly. And so, uh, again, this toggle down here is the cost of our bulk wine uh, per gallon. And, and it, it's kind of amazing, a lot of people might have a, an opportunity to incorporate bulk, bulk wine into their, their uh, uh, production and whatever, or, or creating a new brand and whatever. And uh, I'm, I do a lot of mark, uh, work in, inside in bulk wine transactions. The, the, the best wines in the bulk market are, are available only through the whisper market, all right? Uh, in real estate, it's called a pocket listing. And the seller doesn't want anyone to know 
<laughs> that they're selling. And uh, it's not uncommon for a really, really high-end winery or, or, or specific wine to find that, that their production numbers far exceed the, their sales projections, and they don't want to be left with that inventory. And they've got an opportunity to convert some of that into cash now. And so they'll set it out on the whisper market. Hey, you know, if you know anybody looking, I've got this. And we had uh, actually a couple who deals in that in the Oregon wine business, Meg Murray and, and her husband. They are, they are in the bulk, bulk wine whisper market. Um, I needed 240 gallons of, of uh, Napa Chardonnay to do uh, some some experimentation with, with de-alcoholization and whatever. So I started standing in line at, at, at Safeway. Hey, if you know anybody, <laughs> I'm looking for some, some Chardonnay. Oh, 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 you know what? I just talked to blah, blah, and, and whatever. And I go to the bank. I'm looking for some Chardonnay. The teller goes, oh, you know, my husband's selling some. And, and so it's, <laughs> and it's really wild. I mean, this is the way it works. And, you, you know, you're... You're at a bar, you know, having a drink at the bar, and anybody got any Chardonnay? <laughs> so I found 10,000 gallons, um, barrel fermented. Uh, you would know the winemaker, <laughs> and um, and 5,000 gallons were Rutherford AVA, 5,000 gallons were Coonsville AVA. The stuff was killer, uh, and uh, they wanted 15 bucks a gallon. You can't make it for anywhere close to 15 bucks a gallon. In oversupply, critical down market, I've seen barrel fermented Chardonnay at two bucks a gallon. All right, and, and you don't know about this if you don't even know the market exists. And, and sometimes these are available through the bulk wine brokers and whatever, and if, if, you, if you shop and whatever. This, and if you're looking for a, a new line item or to build up you know, production or whatever, if you don't know about bulk wines, get a little bit more versed in them. Um, so I bought what I needed, 240 gallons. They were happy to sell it. I sent my little port of tanks and sent it off to, you know, to be spinning cone, de-alcoholized, and did my project. And then, um, and then I, I heard that the, the balance of it, 10,000 gallons less 240 gallons, actually sold for five bucks a gallon. Now, you would wonder, why in the world would anybody do that? Well, in this case, it was contracted as Custom Crush. The, it was paid for. And the contractor for, the, for this production walked away, went out of business. And so they owned it. It was free, actually. They made an extra five bucks a gallon just by selling it and getting, they just wanted, they needed to get, get rid of it. And that was it. So, most recent foray into this was um, 50,000 gallons of <coughs> Pinot Noir that uh, somehow 15% Oregon Pinot and 85% California Pinot, or actually Carneros Pinot, were blended together. And it brought up all sorts of labeling and trade issues and whatever, and it ended up selling for, actually we had, it's so tempting, it's kind of addictive, isn't it, Craig? Um, it's like, oh my God, uh, we offered $2 a gallon and they would have sold it to us. But it, it, it just, we, we had to walk away. It's like, what are you thinking? Don't do it, don't do it. <laughs> all right, oh, so, all right, so, so now you've got, any or all bulk wine. So remember, if you're doing a, an entire, put 100% in bulk wine, put the cost of the material in, and uh, you can run your scenario. Plug this in at, at $5 and see what happens. Um, and then uh, we've got state, federal, excise tax. And then here's the, the this uh, indicates a link. So if I click on our little link, It'll open a new page, and there you go. There's your table. And by alcohol, by production size, this would be a nightmare in pull downs and, and whatever, but here's your link. Find it on the matrix and plug in whatever the rate is for the wine you're making. 
Yay! Well, and this also kind of tees you up for your end of your end of year reporting as well. Well, exactly right. Yeah, this and, and this is it. And 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 then when you're done with production in this, and, and again, once you get familiar with this, it's so easy. You can just run in and change numbers and and do all sorts of fun stuff. And and now you've got your end of to to then look at against the real costs and then say, okay, we need to adjust our our production costs accordingly because we didn't account for this or we over, you know, we doubled up on these things. And it and it just Again, we like to, to, to refer to this as a, a graphics deficient ver version of Farmville. And it, it really does become, oh, you know what? God, you know, I, I, I just heard about this bulk wine. Let me, I can't wait to run this. So, okay, so that's how the links work. And, and as we get more information, we'll have more and more links and more hard data. Once we get this, the salary survey, Right now, again, all you can do is work based on basically numbers from California. So if you go to, to the, 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 uh, the uh, winebusiness.com, I think, does the annual salary survey, but it's, it's fundamentally California. Uh, so, so what's your basis here? How much should you pay a tasting room manager, your winemaker, et cetera, et cetera? Okay. All right, so that gets us to there. Barrel costs, this is what I was working, we had a bunch of bugs in this, we'll see if I was able to fix it. So this one's really complicated, <laughs> and on the back end more so, hopefully it's, it's really useful on the front end. We have a percentage of wine that you're putting into a barrel program. We have named these columns French new, French used, American new, American used. It could be Hungarian, it could be all, all French, but you've got sort of four different programs, whatever. A lot of flexibility in the column names are, are just the general uh, uh, selection. So again, remember we use this as an educational tool as well. So what you do is we've got this preloaded used French oak, uh, it, it fills in uh, the equivalent number of cases and how many gallons that that equates to. Then what you do is you put in your cost of the barrel and also what are you doing with the, the barrel at the end of the program. So we've got a, 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 a number plugged into new French oak and then a if you sell it after one use, what, what could you expect to sell it for? Or use that as your internal transfer if you're taking out of the new oak program and then going to put it into multi-year use, you sell it to yourself. And there are dis depreciation factors involved in this and stuff behind the scenes. But basically, uh, then we take the differential between the cost, and, and it might be your resale is zero, uh, and then we're, how, many, um, how many years are you going to use that barrel? So if it's new oak, obviously you use it for a year, and then you've, your, your, your cost is the difference between the, this and that. And then how many months are you going to put it in the barrel? So again, this one's preloaded for a used program, Selling the, uh, selling the barrels as planters on the curbside. Um, 60 gallon barrels and you, you can move those up or down. You can do any, any size. Uh, we've got it in, in oak for 12 months and this is, we, we're gonna get six years of use out of the barrel, okay? Something that very few people consider or know how to, to think in financial terms, what's your evaporation rate? And it can be big. Evaporation per year in the wrong conditions can be 10%, right? Uh, most often they should be in the range of about 4% if you've got humidity control and, and the proper program. But as you start to get a handle on what is my evaporation rate, watch what this is doing here because we're, we're putting in what's the, the loss 
what's the cost of the material to, to replace the loss, which again could be topping wine from material you already have or, 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 or more of this wine. And uh, so then what's your loss in gallons per month uh, and then the dollar loss? How much does that equate into the cost of the topping wine? And then it'll give you the depreciated cost of the barrel program per bottle. All right, um, cost per, is that redundant? Looks like it. And then the cost per case. And then it's adding up over here, so it's factoring in all the different things. All right, so here's how it works. So if I say, okay, my cost was $800 on these barrels, I can put that 800 in. I'm buying, you know, one or two year used French oak, I put that in, and that's going to uh, uh, then, then change my um, profitability there. Uh, you can change capacity. If I say, well, what's the difference if I age it another two months? Now watch the cost of goods up at the top, and your cost is going up as your number of months is going up. Uh, the number of years you use it will then give you um, a basis for, for that. And the uh, evaporation rate, and this is really surprising to a lot of people, um, how expensive this can be. And, and you can see it adding up down here. We've got four months, it's $10,000 over the cost of 12 months for 100% for being in oak. All right, so that all then comes up into the um, cost of wine, including barrel age, and you, you look at the before barrel age and after barrel age, and so it, it's $8.29 per case, 69 cents per bottle, and then that's what it does to the total cost of our finished wine. That's how much it costs you to get to this point for your grapes, for your production. Yes? On the topping wine. Well, it could be, I, actually, if, if what I'm going to do is use some of my own wine and, and hold that back for topping, I could go up to this $42 and just use that cost basis. But now I'm, I'm, I'm reducing, uh, so if I used uh, the cost basis of, of this wine itself, I would plug in $42 and then use that. I could find some bulk wine, and, and there could be an allowance that, that I have for a certain amount of, even for an estate wine, you're allowed you know, some, what is it in, in um, 5%. So, so you could buy bulk wine for your topping wine. You can buy really good bulk wine, and, and then, then keep your production. You don't have to scab in your own production to replace that loss. So it's probably me, but where'd you get the Oh, I'm sorry. 42 is, is our cost of material for this wine. Oh, okay. So it's at the top from the previous page. Yeah, yeah. No, great question. So anyway, does that make sense? And you know, so there's a lot of options on what you're going to use for the topping wine. And if it's a blend, you know, you decide, you know, what you're going to scavenge to do the replacement topping in the other barrels and, and whatever. So it's just, oh, yes. Yes. Okay. Yeah, there there is. So so the older the barrel, the less evaporation, because the saturation, the the uh, the pores get clogged up with uh, phenolic, you know, colloidally suspended phenolics over time, and then tartrate build up a lot of times. So it, it's all it the this whole thing. I mean, brings up a lot of things people don't even consider. It's your um, yeah, you know, when you get new barrels, you you've got a lot of cost of labor and moving it in and and uh, uh, preparing them, washing them, usually treating them with citric acid and and things like this. So there's standard operating procedures. Do you have a barrel washer? Or are you trying to do it, you know, with a pan of hot water and a Brillo pad, trying to get a kid to put their arm in there, um, and then over time. Uh, your treatment and, and uh, ability to clean out 
uh, you know, with, with modern barrel washers, you can really um, uh, improve uh, the efficacy of the barrel year to year. And without, you're running all sorts of risks of contamination and, and, and so forth. Uh, and then environment is, is the really big factor. Uh, if, if it's dry and so on, you could, be, you could literally have 10% loss by evaporation. Um, so. Tim, quick question. Yes. Um, first column is new. You're only going to use those one year, right? Always. Yeah. But, well, you, you actually could. This is, you, you could put it in for two years and have the wine in new oak for 24 months. So you, you could actually accommodate that. Uh, and so. And then when you for like a once-use barrel, that's that second column, you transfer that and assign a cost. That's correct. Or or so you've either purchased it or you've resold it to your yourself. Okay, so that second column is going to rate depreciation for however many years after it's been used. That's correct. Yeah. So if I change it to well, you know what? We've got a number of wines that we use in, in neutral barrels, and we want the gas exchange and that kind of stuff. So I can change this to eight years and hit enter. And it could be that we buy these barrels new, but, but it just goes into the, in, into the whole program for this wine. So I could say, you know, these were, these were $1,300 and we bought those new. So, so you can actually disregard these headings and, and make them up any, any way you want. Again, we use them as guidelines just because... So you bought new, you bought once used, and you bought some neutral and some neutral, right. And they might all be American oak or a combination and some Yugoslavian or whatever, yeah. So the headers are around. They're, are correct. Those are correct, yeah. They're guidelines okay. and not, not hardwired, yeah. And again, it, and, and this is kind of fun, especially with the, the, the steppers because you get this, this, this immediate feedback loop on it. So we, we could go in and say 0% of, of this, 100% new oak, all right, now let's see what's going to happen to our numbers up, up there. All right, did they change? Oh, I haven't put any months in yet. So also, if, if you're finding things aren't stepping and whatever, make sure that you've got enough information. So I've got 100% new oak that in 60 gallons and whatever, but I don't have any duration yet. So I can now see, and this is, this is where I, I think it's fun, um, let me get this so it actually fits on a page here, if I can. All right, so, so here, the change isn't going to happen. Now, I've zeroed this one out because the duration's irrelevant because it's 0%. I transferred it over here for comparison. And now I'm going to add it back in. All right, and we're going to go to... What should we go to? Eight, let's go to 24 months. And you can just, just see what it's doing to your gross margin and, and so forth. But you say, oh yeah, but you know what? I'm gonna use this, it's gonna be two years in, so this, we need to, to now depreciate it over and, and whatever. So we're going to um, put the number, number of years. So you get all sorts of stuff to play with in different scenarios. So Tim, just to make sure that I'm thinking of this correctly, you could theoretically, in the case of like, let's say you have a Chardonnay, you bought, brand new French oak barrels for it, like Ariente does, put them in there for nine months. Yeah. And theoretically, French new would be nine months. Right. And French old oak used, one year old theoretically, would be three months if you went over that for the next vintage. Theoretically, if you were assigned. Is the same wine in the, the new oak or it's being transferred to old oak? Uh, I'm thinking of two lots using one barrel, one for nine months, and then three months theoretically on that second lot would be new. For a different second lot, a different wine, a different, right. yeah, so yeah. In that lot, that second lot, you would be using. That second lot, lot you, you clone your project or, or make a new one, you do that second wine and in its barrel thing, then, then, you, then it begs the question, what's the cost that you're selling it to yourself, the transfer cost fundamentally right. that you're gonna use? And, and, and again, this is where you can play with tax things and, and profitability to determine what, what should we use. Now you could, you, hopefully you can find out what that type, you know, a, a second use 
uh, uh, French oak would be in the general market, and you can use that as your basis. Or you can create it and work with your accountant and say, well, you know, if we did it this way, it might be beneficial. But for all intent and purpose, you, you, you would use just a standard market price that you can call a, a, a barrel broker or even go to winebusiness.com classifieds and find out. So then when you're, you're doing your first wine, it would be new, new oak, nine months, this and that. Um, the second wine, then you would have the new, new, new oak cost and remember, preparation and handling, it's your laid-in cost. It's in your warehouse ready to use. And so it might be much higher than that. Uh, if you're buying more barrels, it's lower. Uh, and then you say, OK, when we're done, we're going to, to transfer it into the next program at, at 900 bucks, 800 300 whatever it is, and then use it that way. So then three months, et cetera, et cetera. And if that barrel's then going to go into use for Alberino or, or other things that, that you're doing, that's great. Uh, we're, at the end of the day, we've, we've got to have the basis that we're going to use this barrel for X number of years. So that will greatly influence the overall cost. OK? We love this sheet. <laughs> this one was a pain in the ass, but, but yeah. But, uh, and it was broken yesterday, but I think we got it fixed. Yay. All right. All right, and, and, and uh, let's see, we're gonna uh, wrap up then. Should we take a break now? We can take a break now. There's So we were just talking uh, about other applications and other ways to use this. Remember that, that, that every starting point, all sorts of projects crop up. Um, you may do really micro lots that you don't even have fundamentally a, a cost per ton. But if, if, if you have some known cost, we were, uh, we were talking about production of fruit wine. Um, if you know your cost, if, if, if you can take all your costs and, and break it down into what, what was your cost per gallon, you can override this whole winemaking thing by putting 100% here, plugging in your cost per gallon, and not worrying about how many tons and so on. If, if I want to go back now and say, hey, wait a minute, we've got, a, we've got an opportunity to bump up our production, all right, and, and, and um, uh, you can change your, your FOB, impact what your projected retail price is. Uh, but you might say, you know, what if we raised our production 10%? So again, watch, watch, your, watch your numbers here. And if I put in 3,300, all right, then you can, you can see what, what the net gain would be, you know, for increasing your, your production 10%. If you... If you know that crop set was lousy or, or you're, you're anticipating a, a smaller vintage, I can put in 2,700 in production and hit, hit that. And, and watch what that's going to do to, to my margin and my bottom line, right? So, uh, and then going to the fruit, what, what we can work on, um, how many cases do you make typically of some of, some of the wines? Six hundred cases. So I mean, you can put five cases in here, and again, if you know your costs of of the fruit and the the ingredients and whatever you put, you would put an ingredients cost in in your, and then it then it'll run the numbers for you that way also. So um, so again, and let's talk so so that uh, if anybody does have any special needs that's in the room, let me know, and the next time I'll ask. So. Uh, 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 for years and years, I worked with something called the Consumer Wine Awards, and it was a study for the consumer perception, and we were counting taste buds, and, and uh, this is work that I do in, in understanding the genetics and the neurology of preferences and, and perception. And so we had actually, uh, the first two years, we, we used professional judges. We had uh, 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 people like Dan Berger and Jim's, Jim Lapsley from UC Davis, and uh, uh, Richard um, uh, 
Peterson, Dick Peterson, one of the, one of the great, great winemakers and legends, really, of, of, of the, the California scene. And uh, uh, we had this one wine that came as statistically as close to platinum metal as, as statistically possible. It needed one more point from one more judge to get a platinum and qualify for a best of show out of 800 wines. Uh, anybody ever heard of uh, a Prairie Berry Winery in South Dakota? Well, look, you'll, you'll want to look it up. It's red ass rhubarb wine. <laughs> I know. <laughs> And, and what we, what, the, the way we constructed the tasting is we had only the judges who love sweet wines judging sweet wines. We didn't, want, we didn't give a, a dang about the uh, uh, opinion of, of even a trained expert who hates sweet wines. We don't want to know what you, we already know what you know or like or don't like. You don't like sweet wines. Why, why, how do you qualify to... To, oh, well, I'm objective. No, you aren't. If it's perception, there is no objectivity. It doesn't exist. It's all subject to many things. But we just thought that was the coolest thing. That, and we wanted to say one of the five best of show wines was red ass rhubarb from South Dakota. <laughs> all right. So, um, we're also trying to address a lot of serious business misconceptions. Misconception. Oh, we're going to sell direct to consumer. We eliminate the middleman. No, you don't. You become the middleman. <laughs> All right? Get really clear on that. Uh, there are costs of doing business in that channel. If you're running a tasting room, you're in the retail business. And, and even if distribution is, I'm taking this case from from the, the, this area or, or, or room in, in production, and I'm moving it over to the tasting area in, this, in the cellar, that's distribution. And there should be an established transfer cost from production. No matter how small you are, you should then give a cost basis so that production profitability and profit and loss and, and is, is operated on a business basis that's separate from the tasting room and the retail sales, who is buying or getting it at a transfer price that is the same as your, your, what you're establishing as your FOB. And maybe you sell it all into tasting room, you still need to have that, that accounting distinction, and it's very important so you know what's happening in your businesses. And when you go into direct-to-consumer in a tasting room, in a wine club, and so on, you now have responsibilities of, for the transactions, for the distribution, for the accounting of it, for a P&L, and, and managing those businesses separately. So what happens is so many people take their cost of goods and then extrapolate that directly into, oh, our retail price is that. That's all pure profit. Eh. <laughs> I got this in the mail the other day. I took that picture on my desk. So if I go into Naked Wines, they give me 100 bucks for any purchase I want and free shipping. There's a cost to doing business direct to consumer, you guys, and it's getting crowded and it's getting chaotic and it's getting more and more challenging and people are giving away stuff. And if you're not able to separate and manage your cost of goods and, and the cost of doing business, uh, in my wine business class that I teach, everybody's asked to go into stores, find crazy stuff on the shelves. And I, and I encourage all of you to start doing this. When you go to a grocery store, we usually go to the area of our passion and we, we look at what's in there and whatever. And we don't even see what's going on elsewhere. Something might catch our eye. But, but really, take some time to think differently. This is the think differently I was saying earlier. And go in and say, huh, how are they doing that? The red blend category is, is a godsend to the wine industry. All right, that it's getting the consumer acceptance, and sometimes it has no dependency on, oh, it's got to be all Rhone varieties or Super Tuscan or Bordelais varieties and whatever. There's all sorts of crazy stuff that gives a lot of flexibility from year to year. You've got to keep a certain 
uh, consistency to the expectation of your market and your consumer, but but there's there's really great opportunities now in, in looking at things for the flexibility and what they represent. We ran across this bottle in Costco. Has anybody seen this? What do you think it cost? That's a rose underneath that was built into the mold for this glass. And this, this is absolutely beautiful. So what do you think it costs? We're not quite sure yet, but the estimate that we've got that for the design and for creating the mold and getting it set up at a point of production was somewhere between $100,000 and $150,000 a bottle. Or I mean, sorry, $150,000. Now, of course, that's going to be spread out hopefully over many years, but how long is this brand going to last? What are the supply chain logistics of this bottle? What is the impact to the consumer. This bottle is about that frickin' tall. Here's a can of macadamias. So it's almost four macadamia cans high. It is a pain in the neck for distributors to have these odd sizes. It's uh, uh, the logistic companies don't know how many of these fit on a pallet. What's the logistics of, oh, we need to forecast for, for bottling. We need to order bottles. What's the lead time for the glass producer to completely change over, do this, execute it, and what's their minimum requirements? And I'll tell you, it's tens of thousands of cases at a time that you then got to store and pay for that inventory and pay up front and, and whatever. Um, by the way, it doesn't fit in a wine rack. It actually will fall tip out. It doesn't fit in your refrigerator. <laughs> it certainly doesn't fit in a wine refrigerator. You won't be able to close it. <laughs> but there's no capsule on it. And there's no capsule on it, dang it, and it's pretty. <laughs> so my estimation this what do you mean there's no capsule on it? Is that the is that a needle lock on there? It's uh, the uh, plastic and then it's got a condom on it or something. Oh, okay. That's yeah. Um, so it, it, does, it, is, it does have a pill for proof that it's required, but it's a beautiful glass stopper. How much does that cost? <laughs> what kind of bottling line can, this is, a, what kind of bottling line does this have? I mean, what's the cost of a changeover star for a, for a new bottle and, and getting your fillers and, and running this crazy stuff? And what are those changeover costs? What are the setup fees and the special equipment now that's required? I was just in New Mexico, uh, 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 where actually the, the, the uh, wine industry is older in New Mexico than it is in California or anywhere else in the U.S. And, uh, and, and you can imagine the kind of, of people that are in the wine business there. They're nuts. And, uh, and I love them. But they also have Gruet. Anybody heard of Gruet? Second largest selling uh, uh, traditional method sparkling wine from Elephant Butt, Elephant Butte, New Mexico. Um, and, and they've got a really aggressive uh, uh, equipment salesperson there. And everybody, it, it, it was, everybody loves her and laughs about it. And, and, and uh, somebody had mentioned they wanted to do some 500 ml, so they needed to find the replacement star. Do you know what the, how much a replacement star costs? <laughs> and it was like some thousands of dollars, you know, for this one piece. And, and the lady got really pissed off because all the winery said, well, let's buy one and we'll all chip in and share it. <laughs> and she wanted to sell everybody a 500 ml replacement star because they're so expensive. So, so when you go into stores, go and Trader Joe's has these big 1.5 liter crazy flasks that come in these really cheap boxes that fall over and break, and, and they're really pretty. They were, they were there for the holidays, but you'll never see them again because logistically they were just a complete nightmare up and down the supply line, all right? So how much did it cost? How much did this uh, d uh, display in the store cost? How many of those displays did they need? What, do the, what are the requirements to get that display set up? Who makes that decision? How does it get there? I was telling the story um, I had uh, when I was a broker in Atlanta. I had somebody at one of 
the distributors that I ran into, and I had all, I had all these obscure wines and whatever, and I was I was just in in shopping at at, at a, a, a chain called well it's it's now Kroger but it was called Big Star, and I and I went up to the merchant and I said, say how how do I get this floor floor space how do I get five cases put up here, oh uh, she goes oh ask, I said, I said what, she said ask. Oh, can I have uh, floor space and five spaces? She said, oh, you betcha. I'll set it up. I'll get the order. I said, no kidding. You've got that kind of power? She said, yeah. I'd do the merchandising. You know, so I'll call the salesman. We'll get, it, get your display in. I said, no shit. Will you do that a bunch? It was, I love this woman. I want to take her home and cook her dinner. Honey, we've got a new friend staying with us. This is so, I, I never knew all I had to do was ask. What, what is that decision-making process? How do you do that? Maybe it's a, 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 your favorite wine store locally, and there's a lot of pressure. You're in the wine country, right? So go to the places where there's less pressure, and places where you can stand out, build relationships, get to know merchandisers and salespeople, the gatekeepers between your product and the shelf. When you get to the shelf, what's a selling price? <laughs> So if you go into most modern wine stores, you'll see these tags. There will be an MSRP, which is a complete fantasy. It's totally made up. Anybody who paid that price for blinds or, or furniture or whatever is kind of silly these days, especially with online options. Then there's an everyday selling price, or what's called the ASP, uh, average selling price. And, and that's a very, very important number because the prices will be all over the place, but what's the average that actually people pay for a product? And then there's a discounted price, which we'll get to. Um, this chain of store right now in Bend has all Washington wines 30% off. An additional 10% when you uh, buy six or more. They're losing money. Who's paying for that? How, how does that happen? And they'll do it store-wide. They, they, I think every other month, they'll do a week, every wine in the store, 30% off, additional 10% if you buy six or more. How does that work? Anybody know? We'll talk about that more at the end, so that's just a teaser. And it's, you're, you're, you're not only Marketing your product, uh, the big kerfuffle going on. Oh, that's my favorite word for these uh, kerfuffle in the Sonoma Plaza. I think they've got 27 remote tasting rooms all fighting for attention and pushing out everything else, and everybody wants to be there. And they've got so so now you know here's here's a a person coming. Now it's great because you've created a center that people can try different things, but now you're competing. And a lot of these are collective tasting rooms. So you walk in the tasting room, there's four or five wineries in, in, the, in the single tasting room, and then they've all got their products. Just had somebody in my wine business class, and she was unaware of what a secret shopper was. And um, uh, in the Sierra Foothills, runs a tasting room, and one of, one of their uh, custom crush clients said, can we sell our wine in the tasting room? And it happened to be the guy who's also their tasting room manager. And she said, sure, that'd be great. You know? And they came up and with a, um, a percentage of sales, but didn't have a contract for it. And unbeknownst to this person, but later started to come back, she says, I I'm hearing that when we're gone, this guy sort of shuts our wines down and only sells his wines. And that's when I said, have you ever heard of a secret shopper? She said, no, what's that? <laughs> I said, get somebody to go in and find out what's going on when you're not there. And sure enough, when the owners were away, the, th this guy was hijacking their tasting room. Yeah. And then lying about sales because he didn't want to have to pay them the percentage and whatever. Hmm. Can you say you're fired? So what determines a, a selling price? What, what do these kind of decisions do in terms of your profitability, your costs, your supply chain logistics? Uh, are you, do you have sustainable practices? 
a lot of people get into certain loops that they offer a discount. Uh, this was found, if, if, if anybody looks over the, uh, the flash sales site data that, that, that is tracked, this is like Groupon and, and uh, companies like Invino and whatever, where, where you can sell a large quantity, it's highly discounted and whatever. But the sustainability is once you sort of set up a, a, a pricing, uh, and especially when you bring it down, it's near impossible to get it back up. And so if you've set an unsustainable, so people would see a, 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 a high discount flash sales site for a product and that becomes their new expectation. And same thing with the gatekeepers, the, the, the uh, buyers in the stores and the restaurants and that kind of stuff. And then you're not only mod marketing your product, your tasting room, your wine club, and what's now tracking is one of the most irritating things that people are reporting in tasting room experiences and the incentives to sign people up for the wine club or in many, many visitors' environments are creating pushback. Just leave me alone. I'm not coming back to your winery. Quit. Quit. Just stop. It's this constant, oh, have you signed up for your wine club? I'm here to taste wines. If I want to sign up for your wine club, I will. So be really, really careful with your promotional strategies and tactics and what you're doing because, because again, you, you, you might be getting pushback that, that you're unaware of, okay? So as you go around, do that. Um, look at things a little bit differently. And, and this is kind of the whole list of the supply chain and, and, and often the value chain decisions. So your grapes, do you grow your own? Do you buy them? Are you going to full production? Are you going to contract, custom crush? Uh, are you going to be part of an alternating proprietorship model? Is everybody familiar with alternating? Anybody need, need background on that? Okay, so shared facilities. And the environments of, of alternating proprietorships can be really, really incredibly positive or really incredibly negative, <laughs> all right? Because people, you could be sharing technology and techniques and you've got a problem and you go to another winemaker who's dealt with that and is right in the same facility because you're sharing the equipment. Or it could be this clashing of personalities. Don't touch that, it's, you know, I'm using it, whatever. Uh, there's the bulk wine market and then the Shiner market, the selling of goods. Uh, Shiners can also be a, a good additional revenue opportunities for, for wine clubs, for tasting rooms, so buying finished goods without a label if you're looking for something to augment or a short-term thing, but you can also build brands around Shiners. Uh, then when you get to distribution, you've got the three-tier system. Uh, going through the three tiers of licensing, we'll talk about that. Account direct. If you are in-state, have your wholesaler's license that you hold and can sell directly to restaurants and hotels and so forth um, and stores. Uh, cons direct to consumer, which can be a tasting room. It could be uh, your wine club, your online sales. Uh, but it's not third-party online. So if, it's, if you're selling to somebody who's then selling to the consumers, wine.com, whatever, third-party online sales are not uh, direct-to-consumer because they're taking a cut of the profitability, so it's not direct-to-consumer. And, and sometimes it's just a fee pass-through that, that they attract people to their site, sell your wine, but you actually then uh, uh, do the fulfillment and whatever. Uh, even that's not direct-to-consumer because it's going through the third-party, okay? And then point of sale, on-premise, uh, restaurants, bars, and so forth, Con the wine's consumed on your premises, off-premise, which is retail stores, wine club, and internet, okay? The other thing is, is to, to really start to be aware of implications on a, on a global level. Uh, uh, China just retaliated. Uh, uh, with, with wine, which is also often a, a target. <clears throat> now, the good news is U.S. is an, a, an export-based <laughs> uh, industry, right? We suck at, at export. Um, and our duties and taxes in China are, from the beginning are significantly higher than they are for Chile or for Australia and France and, and whatever. So we're already have a, a pricing challenge in, in the China market. 
but there is a, a good volume that, that goes there. Uh, it's going to have an ad additional 15% retaliatory tariff attached to it. The question becomes, they say, well, I don't do business in China. That doesn't affect me. Well, you've also got to start to think, where is that wine going to go? And there's really no other market other than have, having it stay here. And so that's actually going to add to the supply of product in the United States, because there's very few markets you can sell US wines. If the dollar becomes strong, that means French wines, Australian wines, New Zealand, Chile, all become cheaper like that, uh, just on an exchange rate base. The, the Pinot Noirs from Burgundy and uh, uh, Syrah from the Languedoc and those kind of things become more of a competitive threat. And those countries are export-minded countries. They subsidize the wines heavily sometimes. And, and so it's going to create a much uh, uh, more problematic supply issue and, and price pressure on products in the US. So don't ever think you're insulated from this and that the key drivers are supply and demand. And, and over and above that, spirits and craft beers, especially cider, hard lemonade and soda. Uh, has anybody seen the alcohol water? It's, it's being nationally advertised, hard water. So it's water with alcohol in it. So you can, what's that? Not with calcium. Not with calcium. I'm not sure. It could be. But, it, but it's literally just water with alcohol in it, and it's, and it's actually being nationally advertised now. I saw the, the ad, I think, just before Christmas. It's like, what? I even tried it. How was it? Awful. It's got to be awful. Yeah. Yeah, yeah, it just smells like it's just alcohol and water. It is. <laughs> what are you going to do? Um, we're, there's also now economic impact uh, and pot tourism and whatever. Uh, the first data is coming out of Colorado and, and the implications there and what it's actually doing to erode wine sales. And it's starting to become really significant. All right. And so, of course, Oregon's right in the mix of that, and that now it's opening up in, in California and, and others. So, so more and more pressure and competitive options. Um, and then we've, you know, then we've got generational shifts that uh, uh, millennials are a, a big buzz right now, right? And, uh, uh, and their values aren't many of our values. And each generation, they're less and less what the values were and what so, so how are we going to adapt to that and whatever? And, and on the millennial front, I'm becoming an expert because I own two. <laughs> I've, <laughs> I've got a 22-year-old and a 33-year-old. And, and the 22-year-old is like, I just don't get you. <laughs> and don't think the mill millennials are just like one group. They are an incredibly highly diverse, their needs. Our two millennials, one is Mr. Bling, he's the Bling King. Everything's got to be branded. He's, he's so intense and he's so passionate about his paleo this and you really need to start taking MCT oil and, and if, if he's shopping for this, it's got to be the best. And you know, the other one is a dumpster diver. And, uh, and he and his girlfriend, he's electrical engineering, so he's <laughs> Sheldon in the Big Bang. And, yeah, hey, how are you doing today? He says, well, that's, you know, that's a very uh, arbitrary and subjective question. You know, let, and it's like, oh, shut up. I just, how are you? Well, I can't really answer that. <laughs> and uh, he and his girlfriend uh, come up from UC Davis, and, and they're at our dining room table with their computers open, gaming together, and their cell phones next to each other, and, and they don't talk. They text right across the table because they don't want to talk when the other person's you know, just at a new level and, and involved in this whatever it is going on in this game. And so if you text, you hear the ping and whatever, but you can get done with that. OK, now I can answer you. So they literally sit across the table from each other texting to communicate. It's crazy. All right. Um, so, so a lot of things go into the, the things that are driving the wine business and, and how all that works, all right? Um, 
All right, so then we'll get into this after lunch. So let's go back to finish up with our margin calculator. All right, so after, there's an additional work page, and for fruit wines, this would, this would be uh, uh, really valuable too. So after you've got your product, and whatever, and you're, it, are, when you're preparing for bottling, are, are there any treatments and, and things you might, exceptional costs over and above those that were already handled in your production costs? So maybe you've got a certain vintage, you've got to have, have a, a reverse osmosis machine come in, or you, you, know, you need something done or whatever, so you can, you can put in, uh, I know that nobody uses Oak Alternatives, even though it's become a multi-billion dollar company. I'm, but you know, there's blocks, chips, liquids, powders, and, and additives. Um, you also uh, uh, need to put in, what does it cost you in relative cost per case for the storage of wine in bulk? And how long do you hold it? Uh, it you, you might just let it settle whatever, it goes into a tank for a month and then it goes into bottling, so you'd have a month, but sometimes you, you might have neutral large storage or, or additional storage that's, that's not your oak program. So you account for that here. And then if not already included, again, anything you might need to do is a, an exceptional cost for stabilization and clarification, filtering and treatments and so forth. And then that gets to case goods. All right, and the storage of those um, for how long before and after tax, and I got in and out fees added, Bree. Did you oh, notice? Yeah, yeah. I know it, because <laughs> uh, apparently somebody yesterday has these pretty exorbitant. It, they 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 have a warehouse and they get every time they want to go in, they get charged for it. So um, so we we. And again, this is how quickly we adapt and, and change to improve this product and, 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 and uh, make it better and fit your needs, okay? All right. That then brings us to packaging. And there's a couple of options on this page. And one is, if you know the cost of your boxes, bottles, capsules, and whatever, you know the case costs. You just simply enter it up in the top left. Or you can do it on a line by line basis. What are your bottles? What are your corkscrews, caps, uh, those things, labels, and so on. Don't, and when you do labels, uh, um, anybody have a storeroom in your production facility that has roll after roll of old labels? <laughs> Yeah, so, so don't, don't just use the cost of labels used, it's how many labels were produced, okay? Um, and that might be way, way different than actually usage, and then you, know, you, know, you change things over time. Uh, boxes are usually included when you buy the bottles, but you might want additional graphics or, or special things, so there's a line for, for putting in for, your, for, for additional costs for that. And then anything else that you want to add, there's a user field, tissue, or hand bottling, or wood boxes, and that kind of stuff, okay? And then that gets you your total cost of packaging. From there, then, um, what's the cost per, per bottling and filling? And uh, if you've got your own bottling line, you need to figure out how much that's actually costing the labor, the equipment, and whatever, and break it down by your production. Come up with, get a handle on what your bottling costs are. If you're using a, a mobile bottling facility, they come in, they, they give you a per case cost based on uh, how many cases and that kind of stuff. Uh, you might have additional bottling line setup or changeover fees, so uh, mobile or in-house. You've got to stop work, you've got to change things over, you've got to run to buy the 500 ml, or borrow the 500 ml star from your neighbor that you all collectively share. Uh, and, then, um, and then any additional packaging, bottling costs, any treatments that are, that are done, uh, stipulated. 
If you're working with a mobile bottler, you may simply have this, but they'll often charge a setup fee. So you can put that in in, in whatever you need. And then we finally come up with what's called the finished cost of goods. So our previous was the cost of finished wine. We now have it in a package. We have the bottles, the boxes, uh, everything's ready to go and your, your, your goods are, are finished and ready for distribution and sale, okay? Any questions on that worksheet? That one's pretty straightforward. And again, when you're shopping around for labels and whatever, you can, you can do a project, clone it, and run new scenarios, or just play with the numbers in here and see what that does to your, your, your margin and your cost of goods and so on. And then the final part of this is now looking at what, what's your breakdown. So this is, this is uh, can be printed and shared. Um, what was a, a, as a cost of finished goods, how much of was grapes, production, bulk line, barrel aging, storage, packaging, et cetera. I think all of us have seen these things by wine folly, what goes into a cost of wine, and it's always a bottle graphic, and they give percentages and whatever. <coughs> They're very often so different from that, right? Uh, and and it's, it's really important in running in sustaining a profitable business to, to, to capture and know and understand what goes into these. Yes? Is there a rule of thumb what percentage should be your grade, what percentage the, these, these are the, when, when we re refer to the benchmarks, that's what we're, we're searching for and no, there are not. I mean, there are really not. Uh, I mean, if you, if you take the range of Napa Cabernet per ton price, it ranges from $1,000 a ton was the low price in 2017 and 50,000 was the high. <laughs> you know, so, you know, how can you do that? And how can you know? And uh, uh, so, but to that point, what we're going to be doing more and working with Bree and, and need everybody's participation, we're hoping that you guys will actually tell other wineries about this and, and help us because the more people we get using this program, the more likely people are to say, you know what, yeah, I'll fill that survey out. And, and so that you're all collectively running your businesses better. Uh, maybe even one day you'll be hiring people because you know, they knew how to use this. Yes? I just have a quick question on the um, cost of packaging. So you can either put in a total cost or you can break it That's correct. Oh. Well, you, I mean, if. if it will calculate. It's not looking like it is. Oh, let me see. I'm not sure. Okay, let, let's make sure we don't have a bug because. Maybe. Yeah, All right. So, so if you use one you don't want to use the other. So you'd want to zero all these out. And if I, let me see if I. I can't, I get it. I can't use, I can't put in up on top the cost and then add, like say, let's say I'm responsible for doing the I can't do that. Right. I can't put in their. Oh, you, I, I, I believe you could. All right, so let's let's happen. Let me see what it what this does. If I hit zero here in tab, oh, I think you can. So yeah, so 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 put the fixed and then put the variables in the other. Yep, that should work. Yeah, no, no, and and again, this and this is why we can't come up. What are what are the costs? I mean, they are they are literally, and then also just big big questions in the storage of the finished case goods. What what is considered production storage costs versus sales and marketing, and 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 little things like that. You you could choose to actually there 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 is a point where where case good storage in bond until it's released should be construed as production storage. And that should be a pr cost of production because you're actually finishing the wine. You haven't released it for sale yet. 
So that second field might be a zero because you're going to char charge storage fee to the tasting room, to the sales department, because it's now going, and it may, may even stay roughly in the same place. I think you've got to move it physically into and out of technically a bonded in an, to, to taxes paid. So, you know, all these questions come up. So how are people reporting? And the other thing is that, that that people say, oh, this is great because you'll collect this data and then that'll give us the benchmarks. Well, actually we can't because we don't know who's doing an educational fantasy, who's playing with something or what's actually real or not. So we can't use this as the data collection device and that's why we're gonna be working closer and closer. We got a salary survey and once we get that salary survey data, we can put a link on when we get to the sales and marketing, what should you pay, what are the standards high and low and average for a tasting room manager, for part-time people, what are the hourly rates, you know, how do you, because, you know, hiring people becomes more and more problematic as demand goes up and, and, uh, and it's a really critical part of things and you've got to make the, you know, you're, you're trying to balance out keeping your expenses down by hiring quality people that'll stay with you, you know? So what do you need to be competitive? And then, you know, and it, so the, that rolls into the black hole. Yeah, yeah. I still have the email anymore, but so there's like a survey page that we can just hop on there. Okay. Yeah. Thank you. Should, yeah. yeah. There should be well. okay. and, and so this is going to give rise to all sorts of new studies too, as, as these questions come up. What can you share with us the average cost per ton of production of, of these different varieties and in these types of wines and whatever? Then it when we can get that data collected, then we can finally say, okay, here's, here's a benchmark for that. Here's what it should be. Here's, here's the breakdown. If we get enough, of, enough people that would share the information with us, we could say, send, send us your, send us this, <laughs> right? And we'll get the data input and we can say, but right now, again, it's, it's just so all over the board that it makes it pretty tough. So once you've, once you've got a handle on this, and, and this is what's really fun about having Keith and, and the other financial people participating with us in this whole project, is you, the first couple times you do this, you're just gonna actually be learning to use the software, saving things and, and whatever. Then once you have a certain facility with it, you'll be kind of amazed at how quickly you can just plug numbers in but you're gonna then have the question, who, who gives me that number? Where do I get that number? Um, and all of a sudden, you're working with your team and, and with your finance. Who, who does their, all their own financials and whatever? Anybody? Okay. So you're gonna to have to start look at, looking at your end of year and your reporting and your tax and, and whatever, so how can I get this number? I, I know it. But, it, but, it, but it'll, it'll give you a new sense of purpose when you're, when you're looking and say, you know, oh God, this line item ought to go into my cost per ton of production that I need to break down so, so that I can do this. And, and, the, and the really cool thing is this is so much simpler than any Excel spreadsheet of this kind of stuff we know. I mean, it just doesn't exist. Um, and, and that's what gets us really excited because it really does have a use. And you can go in and run a scenario. In the first year, you're just, it's in technical terminology, it's called swag, a scientific wild ass guess, <laughs> you know, and, you, and you're just plugging numbers in. And, and now you're sitting down at the end of the year and you've got the numbers, you, you know, and, and you're looking at, at your financials and you say, oh, all right, I've got to make a note that this is, this is how I need to reflect this in this in the future. And so, so it becomes more accurate over time. The, the biggest thing we're finding missing in, in most of the wine business is number one, what, what have you been using for forecasting, right? So you've got a vintage coming up and you've got Tempranillo out there and you've got Albarino, you've got Chardonnay, Pinot Noir, Cabernet, Syrah, all these different things. So what are you using to forecast what that's going to look like? 
And, and in a way that you could kind of say, you know what, we're, it's looking more and more likely that we're going to, to be getting a large crop. What, what's the impact now if I for, re-forecast my, my tonnage and, and my, my, my production? You know, how does that look now? And like maybe, oh my gosh, this is a really great year. The market's soft. Everybody's had a great year last year, high production. Am I going to be able to make these numbers, or do I have to revise that down? And now you've got a cost per gallon as a basis if, if you want to sell some wine as bulk wine and, and whatever. If you need to buy bulk wine, you know what your cost per gallon is. So you, you've got a basis then, what should I be paying if I'm going to supplement this with some external wine? So it really becomes a valuable tool. Then also bring in your team, sit down you know, at a production meeting, put it up on the screen, help us with the numbers here. You know, what are we doing? What, what, did our, what was our, our cost on those new barrels that I just saw, you know, uh, being delivered that are out there wrapped in plastic? And, and are, how long are we going to use them? And, and plug in those numbers. So, so it, it, it not only gives us the ability to create this, but I can also say, you know what? Okay, I've got my project here, I've saved it. This is my 2014 blend. I'm going to save this. I'm going to clone it. And I'm going to now save this again and work on my 2015 projections. So I've got all this data in. What's going to be different? And I don't have to enter all this data again, I need to go in and make the adjustments for production. We want to increase our production or decrease it, or the vintage is looking like this. Great prices are going up or going down, uh, et cetera, et cetera. So, so that's a very important way uh, to use it. And then on the educational front, we've got some really exciting developments. Now, uh, just so you'll know, we're going to uh, break for lunch in about 10 minutes. And, um, and then reconvene at one. Uh, but some of the things at the back end that, that were going on, for seven years, uh, we've been using an old set of workbooks. Uh, these are completely new. They've, they've, they're the result of working with finance and custom crush and principles and growers in Oregon. So we're building this for you guys. And we'll improve the quality of the data and the information that we're, we're providing. Um, we're also, uh, right now I'm on faculty at Washington State University, but we're talking to Linfield and, and, and uh, uh, other uh, entities to start teaching this and offer classes using this. And not only for the wine business, we actually have a number of colleges, Michigan State University and so on, that want to use this in their business schools because they're, they're constantly looking for project-based things that are engaging and they're, fun, they're not widgets or you know, uh, carrot juice or something like that, something that they know the students will, will have a little bit more engagement and whatever. So we're looking at general college use applications and we're going to have uh, uh, versions of these forms that, that can be used in hospitality, viticulture, enology, and, and business schools. Uh, this fall, we're launching the first ever intercollegiate wine business competition. And we're going to have teams. We've, we've actually got over a dozen uh, universities worldwide, including uh, 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 Hong Kong Polytechnic and Cornell and whatever that want to participate. But the four core teams look like, and we've already got the first round funding. It's going to be Michigan State University, Penn State, Washington State and University of Texas, the Kellogg School of Hos or uh, uh, Hilton, the, the Conrad Hilton School of Hospitality. There's going to be each team will have a faculty facilitator. Um, they'll they'll have these workbooks available. Uh, they'll have a business plan template, and they've got to uh, create the name and the labels. They've got to make sure labels have all the correct legal information. They have to 
uh, run, run the, they'll be given parameters for a red blend for a certain price range. They've got to do the business plan, see how they can maximize profitability. But the most fun thing is each team's going to reserve, receive a box of, of mocked up bulk wine with uh, 12 bottles, or probably actually 10 bottles of red, and we might even throw a couple bottles of white in there. Uh, they will, uh, each bottle will have a mocked up cost per gallon. So some of the, there will be wines as cheap as $5 a gallon. There will be wines as expensive as $35 a gallon. And they'll have to then blend to the best of their ability for the aesthetics and also for the economic return that they're going to get, which is absolutely a hoot. Um, and then we'll have a, a judging of the labels, the business plans, the financials, and the final judging of the finished wines, which we <laughs> were so excited about. But w wouldn't it be great if you could hire a tasting room manager that knew how to run a business pro forma, <laughs> that you had a wine club and you say, OK, here's our six different wine clubs, and this is average cost of goods, this is the, the cost to the, the wine club member, this many shipments a year of this many bottles, and you can do six variations of that, and you can put in all your shipping and packaging and marketing and, and everything, and actually have a budget that you're running these things by. So that's what we're developing. So the final part of this, and this, that'll get us uh, to break and segueing into uh, the afternoon session, and that is, uh, remember on, 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 the, on this front page, hang on, let me go back to this just a second, that we've uh, got an estimated uh, reference uh, retail price. Come on, give it to me. All right, right here. And, and remember that what, what affects this primarily is what your FOB cost is. So if we put this at $150, now, Watch all our profitability and whatever, boom, the big drop, but we're actually now under $30. And you can, you can look at different scenarios with this. If it's $100, can I, you know, can I sell it for this? Yeah, you can still make money, and we're now at a 1999 projected. We're going to get into this in, in high detail. But these numbers are coming from the last page, all right? And remember, it's a matter of, of your production numbers, your cost of goods, and, and your case production is, is what's, what's creating this. And then the basis for that is, is we transfer your winery FOB that, that you're setting. Uh, we then um, take a distributor laid in cost or landed cost. And so for anybody who doesn't understand that la languaging, once the, the wine leaves your possession, it's now in the possession of a distributor, all right? And again, it might be in the back of your SUV going to a local store or something like that, but it's, it's, left, it's left the house, all right? Now, there's still stuff that we'll talk about. You can still get billed back for stuff. You, you haven't quit lo losing money on this. Um, but for all intents and purposes, it's a, a trans transfer of ownership. Uh, and the landed cost is after freight, insurance, and taxes. It's now in their warehouse. Taxes are paid on the local basis. They own it. How much? What's their cost of goods? So that's called the landed uh, uh, or laid-in cost to the distributor. The distributor then marks the product up. And so we've just used a basis for that of a 1.5% markup all right, which equates to a 33% margin for the distributor, and, and that's fairly standard. All right, lot, it's all over the board, but that's the basis we're using. And then they, in turn, after they mark it up, that creates the cost of goods for the restaurant or the re retailer, and, and we're using a 33% uh, markup, so times 1.33, which equates to a 25% margin. Now, grocery stores usually use a 25 to 30% mar markup, okay, and a lower margin. Costco uses 15%. 
Um, a lot of specialty stores use 50%. All right, so again, there's, there's no absolute standard. And of course, restaurants market up double, triple, four times cost, so four or five times. And we'll talk about that and why you need to understand it and, 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 you, and understanding the needs of the gatekeepers are such an imperative, because if you don't understand why they market up like that, then you're, you're only hurting yourself. They're not gonna change it because you think they should. And they're not gonna use a whole nother. I, I was telling a story uh, yesterday about a presentation I made about this really great stepped pricing instead of using a, a, a hard markup formula like 2x cost of goods, it costs 10 bucks, you sell it for 20 bucks or three times, 30 bucks or whatever. So, so there's this really great compelling way that you use a, a, a percentage markup plus a dollar amount or vice versa. So it could be um, $10 times a 50% markup plus $5. So that way your $10 bottle of wine marked up 1.5 is 15 bucks, add five bucks. Your, your less expensive wines, you're still getting the same percentage. But as, your price, it, as the price of the wine goes up, the disparity of price, it looks like better value. All sorts of positive consumer behavior you can elicit. So this was for Restaurants Unlimited. I, they, actually, they're in the Northwest, right? Are they still around here? Anybody know? Kincaid's, and they were based out of Seattle. Maybe they didn't survive. They didn't take my advice. Um, so I, I get done with this whole presentation, and, uh, and my boss, uh, who, or, or actually the, the division VP, who had me come in to give the presentation. I said, hey, how'd I do, Dick? He said, that sucked. I said, what? He said, we should have talked. I said, no, this is a great formula. He says, no, 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 you don't understand. They get bonused on margin, pure margin. They don't care about cash contribution. They don't care about this. All they care about is margin. And I didn't prepare you for that. So you were just talking into the wind. All right, and so that's what happens. That's what we do a lot is we just talk into the wind because we're passionate or we think that, that this is overpriced or they shouldn't do this or that. And they'll, they'll just sell cocktails, they'll sell water. It can be more profitable. I'll, I'll give you a story after the break about that. <laughs> All right, questions? All right. So what we're gonna do after lunch is we're going to now talk about FOB, and I'll give you a little preview, because you will get to go in, and if anybody wants to play with this, save your work. And once you've got this set up, by the way, it should auto-save any time you, you so, so you really don't have to hit save once you've got the URL. It'll keep that, that information there. Um, but when you want to open a new project or a new workbook, you go and go to the pull-down. We're going to talk about portfolio management now. This is a whole brand new program that we created um, because of the need of, of managing a number of different products now and trying to figure out how to allocate them. So if you want to take a look and play around with this a bit, go, go into the auto filter and find the wine marketing sales and distribution category. And we've got a dashboard. And this is what we're going to do. So now we're going to talk about marketing and sales. We're going to create budgets. We're going to look at, at at uh, uh, payroll, we're going to look at promotional budgets and travel expenses and that kind of stuff. But you're going to plug in multiple wines. You may already know the the uh, the cost of goods. You put your FOB. Um, that's how many cases uh, you're producing. Plug that in, and it's going to give you your gross revenue, your margin, margin per case, and whatever. And then you'll be able to. Um, uh, allocate how much of this wine are we going to sell through the tasting room, through the wine club, account direct, through distribution, export, etc. And then it's going to run the numbers for us. So it, and it's, it's actually kind of fun. Yay! Okay. All right, class.
Take a break.